evening and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 152nd take live from the Alec Bradley Lone Star Studios of Euless, Texas. I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always, and I'm so proud, so pleased, and so privileged to be with you all tonight. This is going to be a fantastic show, a show 152 takes in the making. Yes, I think, feel like I'm going to be saying that a lot, but it's this is so exciting to have our guest of honor tonight. But before I get to formal introductions of this esteemed gentleman, I do have to thank the people that make this show possible. And that, of course, is our sponsors. Tonight's show is sponsored by Drew Estate. Drew Estate announced earlier last month the launch of the Liga Pravada Unico Serie Bauhaus, an exclusive release for the European market. The basic tenet of the Bauhaus architectural movement is that every object must have a purpose in design. The new Liga Pravada Bauhaus short robusta pays extra attention to leaf placement within the cigar end, intentionally designed to take the European aficionado through a newly curated experience. Bauhaus is a short robusto that is wrapped in a rich earthy Connecticut broadleaf Kappa includes a bold Brazilian binder and is completed using filler tobaccos from Honduras and Nicaragua. The, you, the Lina, Liga Provada Unico Siri Bauhaus is packaged in an elegant blue 12 count box with gold embossing. Everyone is excited for COVID to be over to travel once again to take on the Liga Provada Bauhaus Short Robusto. Tonight's show is also sponsored by Oveja Negra Brands, four unique companies who share a passion to provide innovative cigars for the next generation of cigar enthusiasts. Black Label Trading Company, Black Work Studio, Dissident, and Emilio are combining premium tobacco with an artisanal touch. Oveja Negra, where art and tobacco collide. Join the flock and visit ovejanegracigars.com to learn more. And welcome, everybody. Really am so excited to welcome in our guest this evening, sponsored by United Cigars. Smoke one today and start living united, Mr. Sean Williams of Cohiba Cigars. Sean, how are we doing tonight? Good, I'm good. How are you doing, Bear? Oh, I am doing absolutely fantastic. I have been looking my forward dog is to doing the great over there too. You hear him? <laughs> he probably no, heard me dog. shouting at the top of my lungs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I have been looking forward to this absolutely all day. Um, this is uh, this is a, this is being a take in the making. We kind of talked about it a little bit in the green room, but before we kind of get to uh, get to everything, I do want to I do want to thank you so much for uh, for sitting down with me tonight. Um, what a what an honor it is to have you. Uh, well, really, really mean, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Of course, Definitely. of course. So, I mean, let's get things started here. I mean, let's. I mean, something simple. I mean, what are what are what are you smoking tonight? What are we smoking? Oh, I'm going with the uh, the OG man, the uh, the original Red Dot, the Cameroon. Uh, with its with its new clothes, uh, we changed the uh, packaging last year and uh, finally started hitting the shelves really through the late spring and summer. So. Uh, this is uh if people remember uh the old original red dot cameroon had sort of the cream wrapper with the uh with the red dot logo well this is a new uh wrapper same cigar and of course the classic toro tubo uh which is instead of silver now it's uh it's red so that's on smoking uh new box there so yeah i just want to go uh something classic um uh this authentic cameroon wrapper uh just kind of a nice way to uh to uh, ease into a nice crisp and uh, cold night here in, uh, in Georgia, man. I uh, I have to say, I, I mean, I love the new packaging. I have uh, this. My second cigar for the night is the the Cohiba back black, the 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 gigante oh, yeah, size. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 I yeah. mean, I mean, it just absolutely fa looks fantastic in these 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 tubos. And uh, but tonight I, I decided to light up something special in your honor. Uh, so I, I've I've I have had one back. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, Cohiba Spectre, and I Spectre, 2019, yeah. Yep, man. and I have it from September 2019, so awesome. it's almost not quite a year and a half old, but uh, but I it was it was time to it was time to bust out and actually uh, sit and enjoy it. So I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, is that your first one? No, no, I actually, uh, and so I so. So funny story. <laughs> Glad you brought it up. So funny story about the first Spectre, right? The uh, 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 the first Spectre, yeah, yeah twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. So um, really, really awesome. Um, you know where you where you discovered those bales of Piloto Cabano that have been aged yeah. in Tercios. One, one bale of Piloto one Cabano. one. Excuse me, yeah. Forgive me. Yeah. Forgive me. Not plural. <laughs> yeah. And um, so that kind of launched this this incredible project that you were able to put together. And I, re I remember that was my first, that was actually my first trade show. And uh, oh, you wow. and I, yeah, you and I had met before, um, mm -hmm. um, but a couple of times outside of, 
um, outside of, well, no, within the context of the cigar industry, but um, yeah, outside of the trade show. Yeah, outside of the trade show. But yeah. so we were there, and uh, and uh, you were incredibly busy, and uh, you kept you kept telling me like just one second I'll be right with. I'm very politely, obviously, but I mean I, I wasn't like trying to get in your way or anything like that. But there were retailers all around you and everything yeah, want to learn about this new project, and and uh, finally you just took a second. I can't whoever you were talking to you said Bear, I'll, um, you know what, just come back and try to get me later. And you hand me a cigar, and I was like, oh thanks, appreciate it, Sean, and and then um, and then I guess I got you. I, I came back, I guess the next day or whatever. Well, that the following night. Um, everyone was talking about the specter, you know, at the media house where I was talking, you know, where I was hanging out and, uh, there, I was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Sean gave me one. And they're like, no, no, he, he, uh, he, they were giving out the, the special event cigars that they were giving. That's, that's what the guy was like, no, it looked different. And so I pulled it out and, and sure enough, it was one of the original <laughs> specters. So I don't know if you gave it to me on purpose or by accident, but I sir, I thoroughly no, enjoyed it I, nonetheless. I don't typically confuse cigars, so <laughs> I meant to give it to you. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, but no, this one, uh, this the second year was was an, and it was. I don't know about equally impressive, um, but certainly certainly impressive. I really enjoyed it, and I'm going to see. I'm really excited to see what it does with some age, uh, considering that's kind of the foundation that it's been set on. So. Um, yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about the, the Tercios process, Sean, like why, uh, why it's uh, so, so important to this cigar. Um, and that's sort of, a, honestly, that's something that's sort of a, a, a common process throughout the, the uh, Cohiba portfolio. And, uh, and quite honestly, um, I wasn't as intimately familiar with the Tercios process before me coming aboard with um, General Cigar and, and the Cohiba family. It's, uh, I, I heard about it, was familiar with it, but I hadn't previously worked with any factory that actually still exercised that, that process. Uh, and it's, um, it's uh, a bit more tedious, uh, uh, certainly uh, requires, requires a, a bit more patience, but it's basically um, for your, 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 your audience that, that's, that's viewing or listening. Um, I'm sure they've, if they've not been to a factory, I'm sure they've seen pictures of cigar factories where they see the uh, cigar leaves aging in these, um, these bales and typically the bales look like sort of a, a burlap sort of potato sack sort of you know and i'm sure everybody's seen those well in tercios basically they they, they take a, a, a palm leaf a, a, a big palm leaf and instead of aging the cigars in your typical um sort of burlap sack they age them in this big palm leaf and what that does it it allows the 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 the, the, the tobacco to Instead of just sort of being stored that way, it's being stored, but it's also continuing to 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 sort of age and and and, and maturate a, a little bit more. Uh, so it's 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 a, it's a it's a process that uh, allows the tobacco to continue to evolve, continue to marry, and 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 um, just sort of you know kind of hold uh, more of the the essence of the tobacco and the character the the the, the, the resident characteristics of the tobacco inside the bale, as opposed to the typical um, burlap sack, which is more porous and and you know releases a little bit more of the essence. So it's just a just a, a more um, um, arduous way to sort of uh, store the tobacco uh, that allows it to continue to, to sort of age and mature and and uh, and and just you know uh, allows it to just get a little bit more complex. Um, uh, but again, it's a, it's a more tedious process um, just by the nature of, of getting. All the the tobacco hands into the into the bale um, and uh, and the storage of it as well. It's just a little bit more. And if guys go back into my feed, my social media feeds, uh, I don't know the last time I've, I've taken imagery of that, but um, certainly when I've been at the factory on a number of occasions, I've taken imagery of it just to kind of let people see it. But it's not something that that uh, and I work with uh, a number of factories with with my own brand prior to coming aboard, and I, I had never seen uh, I never seen it actually in person. So. It's pretty impressive uh, to see that it's something that we still practice, and it's just sort of part of uh, of, of um, just sort of the 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 the, the normal course of um, of uh, caring for tobacco uh, within General Cigar, and specifically within within Cohiba. Do you? I mean, do you feel it imparts anything? Like, obviously, it imparts something special, but do you feel it imparts uh, like a signature 
that like one could identify like oh this this tobacco this cigar definitely has tobacco that was aged in tercios versus you know this what? cigar That's doesn't question. um I, I i don't know that 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 it's fair for me to sort of make that comparison because um we use it uh specifically in, in all of the political bono that that we use within cohiba and um and in the other instance or specifically in that instance uh for the first um uh specter that was polo cabano that was at the time 23 years old so it's not like i i could can smoke that uh uh leaf and compare it to something else that 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 that's sort of stored uh, uh in the typical sense so it's hard to, to to say that uh you know i'd like to think i have a pretty keen palate that i can i can smoke something now uh, I feel pretty confident that I can smoke our political bono and compare it to political bono that 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 that's um, uh, aged and cured in another factory and kind of pick up the nuances. But I don't know if that's something that's that 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 that's very very um, you know uh, easy to 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 detect just in general across different different cigars. Because there's, um, I mean, there are there are several cigars that I I, I really really like the cigar. And um, and they use they use the use this process. So it was it was no shock to me when I actually I actually really enjoyed uh, the Spectre. And uh, I was really again with the second year's rendition of it. Um, what I, um, like you said, you you can't replicate twenty three year old tobacco on a you know on an, a, an annual or even continuous basis. What what was uh, what was different from two thousand nineteen Spectre versus the two thousand and eighteen Spectre? Was it like to, a, to, totally different animals? So the 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 first uh, cigar, there, there were a couple of things that came into play. Um, obviously, if you remember, the first cigar was a seven by 54, so much bigger platform, right? Um, a couple of things went into that. We used a five-year age Sumatra wrapper, an incredible wrapper, I mean, incredible wrapper, but a Sumatra wrapper uh, uh, is, 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 is typically going to be a, a bigger leaf, um, a little bit more uh, venules or veins, uh, uh, more uh, sort of uh, malleable, and 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 you can do a lot more with it. Uh, so we we had a bigger sort of canvas to work from. So that's why the cigar ended up being a, a larger cigar. Uh, but even with that, you had the 23 year old uh, Polo de Cubano, uh, but you had a couple of uh, offerings of La Entrada de Copeo, which is a, a tobacco that uh, we've since since stopped producing. Uh, and it was uh, from a farm in uh, Honduras up near the Guatemala border. Uh, we had a couple of years of uh, Esteli Nicaraguan tobacco that was sherry barrel age. Um, but it was more of a, um, a medium body cigar, uh, um, sort of a, a more floral cigar, um, not much in the way of spice, um, just sort of a different profile. The second cigar, uh, the one that you're smoking now, I, I wanted that one to be um, a little bit more, I guess, dare I say, um, an avid cigar smoker cigar, as opposed to just, um, you know, uh, not just, but as opposed to being, um, um, you know, something that sort of highlighted unicorn tobacco. I mean, I wanted to do that, but uh, I wanted it to be something that, that hardcore cigar enthusiasts could really get into. So I wanted it to be a beefier profile, so to speak. So with that one, uh, instead of, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Dominican Polo Cubano and the Sumatra wrapper were sort of the stars of the 2018 version. And this one, the stars were um, Nicaraguan tobacco. I mean, the wrapper is a uh, five year age, Jalapa Valley uh, Nicaraguan wrapper. Not a lot of people have that. Um, but in the filler was, was, was really where the blend really uh, uh, could dance. And then you had 13 year old uh, Jalapa Valley Nicaraguan tobacco that really, really came through. Uh, we had one year left from the La Entrada de Copel, which is included in there as well, which is again a sherry barrel age. So, uh, so it's decidedly uh, a fuller cigar, uh, more of a spicier profile, more kind of uh, in your face, um, um, with with a little bit of the spice up front. Just a meatier profile, uh, smokier, sweeter, um, but they're different animals altogether. Yeah, you can really taste the sweetness of the Yalapa Valley, particular with the age that's now on this particular cigar. Um, really, really enjoying it. I always felt like the second, thank you for sharing that, Sean. I always felt like the second Spectre had your personal signature to it because, you know, anyone who knows your background, will get more into it, obviously tonight, mm -hmm. you know, you have a, a propensity for, uh, and a love for Nicaraguan tobacco. And so it seemed like this one specifically, it was almost kind of like, this is my term, not anyone else's. 
This was like yeah. Sean Specter. This was the, the Specter that Sean wanted to share with the world. It, so, it, so, so, yeah. So, just in, 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 you know, just so people don't get caught up in any illusions. Uh, uh, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm the, the lead blender. Uh, I guess if, if, if you can come up with, with, with such a term, but um, there are some incredible guys uh, down in the DR and uh, Nicaragua and Honduras, um, but specifically the DR as it relates to uh, the Specter that uh, really, 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 uh, uh, you know, just have a lot of fun with this project along with me. Um, but to your point, uh, I, I did want to sort of move the profile more towards, um, um, you know, highlighting Nicaraguan tobacco. And there, there were a couple of reasons for that, not just so much uh, kind of moving things towards things that I have a proclivity for, but also uh, kind of expand the, 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 the profile of Cohiba, uh, which, historically had not really been known for Nicaraguan tobacco for good reason. I mean, cigar I'm smoking now is, you know, uh, Cameroon. And when I say Cameroon, I mean real Cameroon from the Congo Republic of Africa. Um, Indonesian binder has the political bound or Asian tercios and the fillers. So there's no Nicaraguan components here. Um, and if you look at um, most of the the, 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 the red dot families that we make that are made in the DR, they may to some degree include Nicaraguan tobacco, but you wouldn't think of them as Nicaraguan profile. Obviously, right. the Nicaragua, which is made in Nicaragua. Um, my Silencio, which is my signature cigar that we don't sell, is made in Nicaragua. But as far as, um, for the most part, the portfolio, which is which is regular production, available stuff, um, hadn't really highlighted uh, our bona fides as far as Nicaraguan tobacco. So not just with that specter, but overall with the profile, I've been trying to just do that a little bit and not in any way to take away from uh, the incredible stuff that we do in the DR, which I'm smoking right now, but really just kind of uh, show that, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're not seeding ground, uh, you know, pun intended, uh, in Nicaraguan uh, soil and tobacco. Uh, and and I, I want to do more of that. And that's what I've done throughout the line overall. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to dig into, and obviously, your story and, and what you're doing uh, from, a, from a blending perspective uh, for this iconic brand. I think I, I don't think there's anyone watching or anyone listening to this later on that will, will can question the, uh, the legacy that Cohiba has on the, uh, the cigar industry. So this is, some, again, this is a really great opportunity to sit down and chat with you about it. Um, but before that, I kind of wanted to kind of start with a, a subject that I, I'm really excited to talk to you about because I, I knew I knew um, I knew that you played for Grambling, mm -hmm. you know, you played college ball for Grambling, yeah. and uh, it was we were kind of talking and joking about before the show started. I, I was um, not knowing how old you are. Um, I was like, I was like, is he is he old enough to have played for Eddie Robinson? Um, and, uh, and and and. And you uh, very politely told me, yes, you were, and you did. And I and and I found that I found that out uh, actually before tonight. And so I, I wanted to I wanted to talk to you about um, this man that we were again we were talking about before the show that left such a speaking of legacy. In part, it's such a a fabulous legacy on the world of not just college football, but football itself. I mean, he is renowned among his colleagues, among the th hundreds and hundreds if thousands of players that played for him. Um, I mean, he started a coaching um, before World War II. Uh, and actually, uh, during World War II, uh, uh, for one year during the war, could not field a team due to, um, you know, the, the, the requirements and, 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 and sacrifices that the country was making towards the war. So, yeah. So I was going to ask you that. I was always wondering if he went and served. Um, I couldn't find anything on that. So that, that's great that you knew the story about it. Yeah, no, he had, uh, he had uh, um, um, played college football himself as a quarterback and uh, became a graduate assistant. So, and I don't know what the, what the well, I mean, I guess. So my freshman year, was that his 70th birthday or 72nd birthday? I'm not sure. Um, I remember, I think it may have been his 70th birthday because we, we made a pretty, pretty big deal. And that would have been 19, that would have been uh, fall 1988. So he was 70 then. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think he had sort of passed the draft age. Um, but I don't know that he would have uh, because he was, he was at that, by, by, by the time the war started, he was uh, a college professor and college coach. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, he, he, like I said, we've, we were talking about this. He coached hundreds and, and, and hundreds of players that, and then that, and hundreds of players that actually made it onto the pro level. And uh, you played defensive end for him. 
Yeah. And uh, and uh, so I was really excited to hear that he actually he uh, he had a profound a profound impact on your life personally. Um, so I'm um, just I'm just again I as I told you kind of before the show I'm a, I'm a huge fan. My my father imparted this this um, I guess fandom down to me um, at, at a young age. We were we were watching uh, what, which you corrected me the Bayou Classic mm-hmm. uh, back you know back when I was a child and and uh, he he pointed out uh, Coach Robinson and said hey this this is this you know kind of what we were just talking about a, a moment ago just what he's done for the game of football he said this man has done more for for football. Uh, than any any other coach you'll ever watch and 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 he told me some stories of some stories about the coach because I was like where's Grambling like what's uh, you know again I was a I was a I was a child um so uh, yeah I was and I was like in northern Louisiana man yeah (laughs) but uh I know you've probably got dozens and dozens but I would just I would love for you to share what was some of the most important things that he taught you um Taught me respect, man. Taught, taught, not not just respect as relates to how you relate to other people. That that that's important too. But sort of, just sort of respect for hard work, respect for the process. Um, you know, it was little things like, um, you know, I, I couldn't have had, you know, and this is this is, you know, people may think it's crazy now, but um, I, I had I had a, a buddy here earlier, and I don't know how he just asked me, "Hey, you got any tattoos?" Like, I don't I don't have. I don't have not one tattoo and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I had an earring on my ear maybe for about uh, a month. And that was after I stopped playing at grandma. When I was there, I mean, we traveled in suits and ties. Uh, as a freshman, we all uh, uh, had to sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, get in formation before we got on a bus. Everybody made sure you, you, you were dressed properly, ready to go. Uh, Clean shaven. You could have a mustache, clean shaven, no earrings, uh, no visible tattoos. And uh, we sang the school song. We got our itinerary before we got on the bus. I mean, as, a, as an 18 year old kid, you get I didn't know I didn't know the word itinerary, but I had an itinerary. <laughs> yeah, this is our schedule. Like, OK, when you know, this is this is, you know, you kind of know you're not going to miss the flight because you're on the bus. But we knew, OK, bus is departing at this time and we're on this flight number leaving from uh, uh, you know, Shreveport connecting here, like, like, and, and this is when the, 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 uh, the, the pregame meal is going to be, this is the time to load the bus and go to the stadium. This is like, and you had an itinerary for the entire, uh, uh, schedule for, for that weekend. So it just kind of taught you like a sense of responsibility. Like you had, you know, this is my, this is, this is not my schedule. This is my itinerary. This is, this is the things I'm, I'm responsible for being present for being ready to go, um, having all your stuff ready to go, uh, being prepared. Uh, respecting the process, respecting uh, the tradition, respecting um, your time, right, and, and preparing. Uh, so it's just kind of those sort of nuts and bolts things. But aside from that, man, I mean, this guy was, you know, the winningest coach in college football history by a country mile at the time, right? Had put more uh, uh, players into the NFL than anybody at any level of, of college football. He had put more players into the pros. And, uh, and he came around every morning with the, the old school, I don't know if you've even seen these bells, he used to have them at recess when the principal would come out, clink, 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 and tell you it's time to go in for recess. He would come through the dorms every morning with this little bell, knocking on every door, you know, grad assistants in tow and uh, assistant coaches with him. But he personally, he didn't have to do it. He had a staff of assistant coaches, graduate assistants who could have clearly, easily done it. He did it himself every morning, <laughs> every morning, right? And it was just, he didn't have to do that, right? So got you up for class, man. And um, you had to get, get up out of bed, give him or whoever was with them your, your school ID. And you would have to show up at breakfast at eight o'clock between eight and 8.30, dressed ready for class. And, and they're in the cafeteria, right? And he knows you're dressed and ready for class. Then they give you your ID and you start your day. <laughs> You know, I mean, like he didn't have to do that, man. I mean, but this guy was, uh, he was just so humble. He was so humble. I mean, he had, you know, he had, by this time, he had wealth. I mean, had had his own, uh, um, you know, talk show, uh, had all kinds of corporate sponsors. I mean, we had, you know, Adidas and Nike sponsors, which was unheard of for a small black college, right? Coca-Cola was a big sponsor. We'd have Coca-Colas and stuff, you know, in the locker room, which is crazy. Um, and he lived 
right in this little, you know, I don't know, maybe three bedroom ranch, you know, right mm-hmm. off of campus. Uh, could have could have lived any way he wanted. You know, he could have had a bigger house somewhere, but he lived right there, you know, right on campus. Um, he was just so, so he was humble. Um, he had a certain, um, I, I dare say, a arrogance about him, but not an arrogant in a, in, in a downputting way or a haughty way. It was just like, 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 yeah, it was a confidence about him. Like, like, um, like he knew what he was good at. Um, and let him tell you he was only good at one thing, and that was coaching football. Um, but he wasn't shy about telling you that, right? Um, but anything else, man, um, you know, he just he just just had a respect for for hard work, a respect for humility, a respect for being coachable, and that's something I, I, I never ever ever forgot. Um, and, and 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 I always stay that way now. Like you know, I, I, I I always stay coachable. Like you you. You, I mean, you, you, you look at any of the best in the world at anything that they do, they have coaches, they have mentors. And, and, and I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. So I mean, I just learned a lot from, 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 and, and, I, and, and, and admittedly at the time when you're 18, 19 year old kid, you're like, man, here's this dude coming out of the hall with his bell. I just want to sleep. I've been out of hall. You know, and, and, and at the time, I mean, there was, there was even one or two mornings, man, that I got up and, 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 and hid in the closet. Right. So, <laughs> But then you got to explain, hey, Williams, where were you this morning or whatever, you know? So, so I'm not saying that, that you always comply and you always appreciate it at the time, but man, as you get older, especially as you start having kids of your own, you start having mm-hmm. Still like emotionally like affects me. It's, 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 I can't explain it. And, and all the the, the the grammar players are like that. And, and 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 you know even guys who may not have even ever touched the field. Like and we have our own sort of chat groups and whatever. And there's some guys that that you know I played with who who were on uh, you know the the scout team who never even traveled with the team, but they're still as profoundly inf- uh, affected by uh, their time there uh, as I am. Right. And uh, it's just an interesting camaraderie that that's kind of hard to explain. And, and um, yeah, it was just just uh, amazing, amazing man. And, and um, you know, not a perfect man. You know, nobody is. Um, but just the most, uh, um, you know, sort of. You know, I I I, I I'd be hard pressed to find another man. I think that had more sort of character and 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 um, and um, you know um, you know. As, as, as solid a compass as he had as it related to life, man. So, you know, but I, I can go on, man. So, no, that, that's that's absolutely wonderful. I, I you know, I, I've read his autobiography, the Never Before and Never Again. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. Um, it's it 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 exudes uh, exactly kind of what you were just kind of talking about. This, um, uh, this 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 it's an oxymoron. It's an oxymoron, but this this quiet but loud confidence. You know, he, and never, never boastful. I think that's fair. Never boastful, but just knew what he was good at and and knew that there was no one else that could do it the way that he did. He'll tell you in a minute, uh, you know, uh, it's one of his favorite lines. Hell, baby, I I never blocked or tackled anybody. Like, like meaning that my players did it right. You know, and, uh, and, 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 and he did everything he can to make sure that, that um, more importantly, you know, more, you know, guys went to the pros, some guys didn't make it, some guys who you didn't think were going to make it to the pros made it to the pros. That that could go either way, right? Um, but he wanted to make sure that 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 uh, he did everything he could to make whoever came through his program a better man. And uh, and and there there are thousands of guys that 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 are better for having uh, you know walked on the field at at, at Grandma. You're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about mentors uh, a couple of times tonight because I know that that's a that's a that's a pretty big theme for you um, personally and everything. So that that kind of turns us into tonight's major point. And uh, tonight's major point is brought to you by a brand new cigar to LLS Fumar takes. Uh, that is a Baracoa Cigar Company. 
So we want to welcome Barico Cigar Company. But Barico is back, getting ready for the relaunch of the Voyage in early February. We cannot wait for this cigar to come back. It's been over three years, but now with a revamped blend coming out of an entirely new and one of the hottest factories in the industry. Danny Vasquez promises to be like, uh, promises if you like the original blend, you're going to love the relaunch. Stay tuned for more details for how you can enjoy the Voyage and never settle Baracoa Cigar Company. So, Sean, to, tonight's major point, I kind of wanted to go, like I said, I, I'm going to bounce around kind of a timeline here, but it, it all kind of centers around this decision that you made a couple of years ago. Um, you had built up a very successful boutique cigar company, built up, filled with fabulous relationships, um, some amazing cigars, and right. then you become the the guy, which we're going to get into the term, the guy for Cohiba. Yeah. Um one of the most iconic brands in this industry's history, like not in the history at the industry at the time, or it's really hot at the moment. No, Cohiba is one of the most iconic brands in the history of the brand. So we'll get into El Premier Mundo in, in a few moments here, but I, I'm really anxious to hear this story because I, I, I heard a quote from you uh, about how when you, you were approached about being the guy for Cohiba and you were like, I'm not sure Cohiba really needs a guy, but okay. And you started the, you had, you had an open conversation yeah. with the folks over at, uh, at general. So, uh, you know, share how this kind of came to fruition and, and why you ultimately decided to, uh, to become the guy at Cohiba. Yeah. Well, as you said, I mean, I had, had my, my, my own brand that I, I, uh, you know, operated it exclusively for a number of years. I, I think at the time uh, that uh, General reached out to me, it was 10, 11 years, uh, maybe 11 years, because I think I released my 10-year anniversary cigar the year before. Um, but uh, Rick Rodriguez, um, you know, the, 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 the guy for CAO, um, he and I had, had been, uh, been, been buddies for a number of years. I don't remember exactly, maybe, maybe 2008, 2009, um, about that time we met and and um and we would we, we would talk intermittently um you know trade messages here and there text and checking in and of course we see each other at different events and so forth and uh and we'd always always kind of just joke that you know one day we're gonna do something together and, and i'm like yeah okay that'd be awesome right um and uh, i got a, a a text from him uh around the holidays in 2016 um just kind of checking in how things going um you know hey good on my end, how things with you, so forth. And, uh, you know, hey, do you have time to talk uh, tomorrow? I'd like to you know, get on the call with you. Like, cool. So we talked the next day, and that's when he sort of teed up uh, the idea of, um, of um, you know, joining up with General and, and, and being the guy for, for Cleveland Cigars, you know, such as he was for CAO. And I was, and my, you know, my, my sort of take on it was like, well, you know, I, 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 I couldn't imagine that Cohiba needed a guy, but, um, you know, that's a conversation I'd certainly be be willing to have, and uh, that's a, that's kind of how it started. Um, but you know, obviously there, there's a few moving parts that sort of have to get settled uh, as far as you know what happens to 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 uh, El Primer Mundo and um, and what my role really would be. Um, you know, coming on board with General General Cigar and uh, and Cohiba. So, you know, it took uh, took a few months to kind of. You know, iron those things out and uh you know uh not 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 very long i mean it it, it actually moved faster than than uh i initially thought it would you know you know general is obviously a really really big company um in relative terms as, as it relates to the cigar industry um so i was kind of concerned that that things would drag on a little bit and and, and i had some concerns as it related to the, the convention that was going to be coming up uh, in the summer of 2017 and, and all the commitments I uh, had already made and ha would have to solidify ahead of the show. Um, but things moved along pretty quickly. And um, yeah, came on board, uh, signed my contract in April of 2017 and officially started uh, May 5th, 2017. That was uh, right after the launch of the Blue, the Cohiba Blue, right? It was just right before mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. before your tenure started? Exactly, exactly. Uh, Cohiba Blue was, was launched in March. so. Um, so the, the two new things at the show in 2017 was Cohiba Blue and me. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, 
I, I have two comments about this this period of time. First of all, um, I I have to say that when I saw that you were becoming uh, uh, the new uh, guy for Cohiba, <laughs> um, I was so I was I was I was heartbroken um, because of um, what I had come to love in El Premier Mundo. Oh. Uh, a lot of the projects that you had done, a lot of the cigars that you'd done, um, and knowing that that was, you know, all for all intents and purposes, probably, you know, going to look a lot differently at the very least mm -hmm. going forward. And, um, but I was so excited at the second that the, on the, on this, on the other hand, because um, if I may respectfully disagree with you, I, I think Cohiba did need a guy um, <laughs> because I, Again, we, we, we talk about Cohiba and even even today, Sean, I think Cohiba has this 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 reverence about it. You, you mentioned Cohiba in, in, in a breath when you're talking about cigars and it, it carries this this profound weight with it um, in, a, in a very positive way. Like I said, iconic doesn't there's no negative connotation to iconic. There's just not. Um, but to me, from a retail perspective, from a consumer perspective, Cohiba was what it was. All positives aside, you know, it was it was what it was. And what you injected into it, and, and mind you, in a very short period of time in the last couple of years here, has really reignited um, this this powerful this powerful brand. And I kind of just re put it back up to where I would say where it belongs on the on the pedestal that it belongs on. So I, I respectfully disagree because it it needed something and and you were obviously it because I think you've been very successful at achieving what what I would I would assume has been uh, was general's purpose all along and obviously what your purpose with joining the team and everything because I I think you've done a tremendous job. Well, I, 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 I thank you. Uh, and, and I try every day not to screw it up. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we we we, we certainly uh, um, experienced um, you know a, a great degree of, of 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 success over over the last few years, and and there 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 there's there's a few components to that, right? Um, you know, contrary to what most people believe, I do not design packaging, right? Uh, you know, um, I get to look at it and and say, well, no, I don't like that, or maybe make a suggestion, but there's a lot of people involved in that process. Um, we have incredible, incredible, um, you know, cigar minds that, 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 you know, work at our various factory that, that I get to work with and learn from, um, we have a great team top to bottom. And, and, and also, um, I think internally, uh, good vision, right. Um, you know, in, in that, in that, you know, they give us enough latitude, you know, with, with a few guardrails. Um, to sort of, you know, take risk and try some new things and, uh, you know, and have, have the stomach to do it, um, you know, because it's, it's one thing to say, hey, we want this, this guy to come in and be the face of the brand or something, but it's another thing to say, hey, okay, come in, yeah, you can show up in the uh, shops and be on the posters and be the face, um, but also we want your hands involved in nuts and bolts uh, on the back end and give me the latitude to do that um, with the brand um that 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 that's as substantial as cohiba um you know there there's a lot of brand equity out there uh so that gives you a little bit of room to take risk but boy you can't burn up that capital you know what i mean so um so i'm very appreciative that um they had uh you know i guess the, the vision and and uh and and you know and the mindset to sort of to sort of uh uh be innovative and not give me the tools, but let me, um, you know, kind of work with the tools that they have. Because I mean, they, you know, it, again, we have a really good team, um, um, you know, very, very, um, you know, well healed resources, you know, uh, that, that, that some brands, some companies may not, may not have. Um, so I, I feel fortunate and blessed to have that. Um, but it's been, it's been just, just a, a it's been a better ride than, 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 than I could have ever imagined coming in. Right. It just, just in, in more facets than I can count, man. So um, it, it's, I appreciate the, the warm words from you, but 
I'm, I'm just just as you um, or I, I guess kind of impressed with what you've seen from the brand over the years. I'm as equally honored uh, to be on the other side of this and be and be able to be a part of of, of you know kind of um, you know charting you know what what the, what the future for Cleve is 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 is, is going to be like, and certainly honored to have been a part of what we've been able to do over the last few years, man. So I, I thank you, and 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 that means a lot to me because. Uh, ultimately, yourself and, and the people that's listening, um, you know, you guys are the judge and jury, right, as to whether or not, um, you know, what we're doing is 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 effective. I mean, either you dig it or you don't. So um, I'm just happy that you dig it and, and honored to, to 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 be sitting here talking to you. Well, the the honor is certainly mine, Sean. I I think that um, this this next question I'll ask I'll ask very carefully. Um, obviously, we, we know why you joined Cohiba mm -hmm. from what you're from your words just a few moments ago. But why did you choose to leave behind this 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 amazing legacy that you had built up? Yeah, man. So and that's the word, right? Legacy, right? Legacy is the word, right? Um, ultimately, you know, I, I'm, I'm a cigar maker, right? Um, you know, and and. I've learned so much over, you know, a decade and a half in this business and, and it learned a lot, um, you know, just sort of navigating through this, the landscape of this business with, with my brand uh, for a number of years. And, and I think, okay, well, what, what, what could my legacy be? Like, right. I could have, you know, just to stay exclusively with, 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 with EPM, Alpha Ramundo and continue to, to build it as, 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 as far as it would go and, and, and make inroads uh, 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 as effective as I could and, and um, you know, continue to, 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 to just, you know, build on that legacy as much as possible. Um, but I, 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 I had to sort of sit back and think, okay, you know, how big a platform um, could I ever build with, with, with EPM versus the opportunity um, to, to be a part of this platform and be a part of, you know, one of the most iconic names in the history of cigars. Like, um, man, that's 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 a heavy, heavy uh, thing to to contemplate. Um, and I kind of thought about it. Um, ultimately, I think you know, me as a cigar maker, not just El Mundo, but as a cigar maker, um, I think I could do more from a legacy standpoint um, with you know an incredible brand like Cohiba. Than I can with any other, you know, bl a brand or platform out there, including El Primero. And that's kind of what it came down to. Like, like, um, you know, uh, I, I was really just kind of just just struck that that they thought that I had done enough in this industry that I, I could be this guy. Um, and and you know, and okay, and if and if I really look at myself as a cigar maker and and that guy, then um, how could I not? Um, take take uh, this opportunity and 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 do all the things that I love doing with my tiny little brand for ten years. All the things that I love doing, uh, I get to do here with Cohiba, um, and really, really, I think make an impression, um, you know, on, on the marketplace um, in 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 a, in, a, in a bigger way than I ever could on my own, uh, and and really, I think you know, effectuate. A bigger legacy overall. So, uh, so to me, it was, it was it was absolutely about legacy, but I had to think of it in terms of being bigger than just uh, El Primer Mundo. I mean, El Primer Mundo is 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 um, a part of my DNA, right? It's 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 it it it, 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 it was, you know, the, the the vehicle or 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 the 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 you know the house that that you know, that I grew in and, um, and thankfully, you know, it, you know, I launched it in 2005. So it predates any of, um, you know, the harsher uh, considerations as it relates to the FDA and, you know, uh, what's grandfather and what's not. So it'll live regardless, right? So um, I think that legacy for that brand was solid. And uh, I had some, some, some great releases and had a lot of fun, I mean, Epifania, uh, you know, League of Miami, Larceny with Eddie Ortega and and uh, Eric Espinosa was a great project. Uh, Larmada, so I mean, I put out some some solid stuff and you know got got some solid um, um, 
recognition, uh, both from an industry standpoint and the consumer standpoint. And, and um, you know, so at some point you, you think, okay, I mean, if I'm really a cigar maker and I really enjoy doing this, how can I not do this for, again, one of the most iconic brands ever in cigars? So that, that, that was kind of the, 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 the contemplation for me. And it wasn't a very hard decision once I really sort of settled on, uh, on, on, on the idea of legacy. It's a, it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting story to reflect on, you know, as you, as you kind of, in, in a very short summary, really talked about the, the impact that you had on the boutique cigar world that ultimately landed you in this, this iconic position. But uh, um, I, you know, you, you mentioned some of the, the brands that were some of my favorites of yours, um, League of Miami, Epifania. I told you a story about the first time I became a godfather. Um, where I went to, uh, went over to Michael's and I wanted to celebrate, uh, the, the occasion with something very special. And I, and I gravitated toward the Epifania. Uh, I do have a story about Laura Mandad, which I, I, I still tell you to this day, it was my, my favorite cigar that you ever made. Um, you uh, <laughs> I, I absolutely, absolutely loved, love, love that cigar. Um, so we have this, we play this game over at Michael's. Um, it was, a, you know, Tracy Spence, our general manager very well. And uh, he uh, imparted this, this game on us where he would uh, take a cigar out of, he takes a cigar out of the humidor, he takes off the band and he hands it to you. And uh, the, the, the fun part is to, to guess what it is. Um, but it's also to kind of open up your mind to smoke a cigar with no preconceived prejudice, prejudices. You know, that's kind of the whole, the whole, uh, impetus behind it and the goal behind it and everything um and i remember time and time again doing this returning the favor to tracy all the time giving him cigars all the time and i could um for a time and now i've actually gotten pretty good at it and he's always been really good at it i could never stump him and he would always stump me and until one day he, he handed me a cigar and I got a quarter inch into it and I knew exactly what it was. And I just smiled and I just sat there and enjoyed it. He's like, you already know what it is, don't you? I was like, I do. I do. I really know what the cigar is. He's like, yes. I was like, no, I'm enjoying this too much. I'm enjoying the fact that I know what this is and I'm enjoying it because of how much I really love it. And I'm, I can recognize the nuances about it and I know what it is. And, and uh, about halfway through the cigar, he's like, okay, I can't take it anymore. Just tell me, tell me what it is. And it was, it was the Laram and Dodd. <laughs> um and I, I love I, I I love that story because I, I again I love the cigar and it Thank was you. the very first cigar that I ever I ever guessed blind. Um wow. and uh right. so I was I was just I was just <laughs> thrilled with it. Um you, you talked about becoming a cigar maker and, and your journey, you know, started, you know, you know, I started smoking cigars when I was 18. Um oh, wow. and you you started a little bit later in life. Um and, but it was, you, was you mentioned four and a half years old. Was it 30? Yeah, I was, I was 34 and a half years old. Yeah. Um, which is crazy that you're a little bit younger than you or me now when you, you know, you first kind of, kind of started into this world. Now, the, um, the really cool part about this story is like, you were talking about how, how quickly you didn't think it was going to happen very fast, but how quickly the, the, the timetable shifted for you to become part of Cohiba. Um, but it was, it was, kind of it was kind of a full circle from when you first started with cigars you started uh you uh, smoked a cigar on a cruise in 2005 mm -hmm. and uh what was it less than uh less than a year later you were heading down to Nicaragua right yeah it was uh it was New Year's 2005 so I guess you could say December 31st 2004 January 1st 2005 it was a New Year's cruise so it was New Year's so just say January uh first or so of 2005 uh and january 8th of 2006 i was on a plane going to nicaragua yeah that's incredible that's i, I, don't, rec <laughs> I don't recommend that by the way i don't, I don't, I don't, I don't recommend that okay so i want to I, I want to talk a little bit about this a little bit more so you, you say, and i've heard you say that you don't recommend it what was it about? I mean, you, I mean, you jumped in with both feet, man. I mean, you, you really, I mean, you really gave this, I mean, forget the old college try. I mean, you, you put everything into it pretty quickly. Yeah, Ooh. man. But I didn't know shit. <laughs> I didn't know jack shit. Right. And I thought I did. And, and I see it all the time now, man. I, 
I can't tell you the number of uh, uh, messages I get. And, and this is like, I'm not anybody that's listening or anybody that's watching. I'm not trying to piss in anybody's Cheerios. I'm not trying to steal anybody's dream. Um, but just take a breath. I mean, I get uh, messages all the time, you know, direct messages, Facebook messages, whatever. Hey, I'm starting my own brand. I'll start my own brand. We'd really like to, you know, talk to you and get your advice. And, and a lot of times these are people who probably who were like I was. Like you just, you smoke a cigar and it's just like, you're just so enamored and so taken with it. You think I want to make these. But man, it's just not, listen, it's not, you'd be hard pressed to find a business that's more difficult to be successful in than cigars, bro. You know, so, um, you know, and I can't uh, implore people enough to just, you know, just really just take your time. And, 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 and I didn't have any uh, mentors in the business. I didn't, I didn't work at a cigar shop. Um, I had worked for another cigar company. I mean, I was in the mortgage business. I didn't really know any people that smoked cigars, uh, to, to be honest. That's why I, start, I started the Atlanta Cigar Society, so I could do cigar events and meet other cigar smokers. Cause I didn't have anybody telling me, hey, young buck, slow down, you know? Um, <laughs> but I mean, ignorance is bliss, right? So uh, so I went in, went in with it, went into it, eyes wide shut, because, you know, I, I didn't know a lot. But one thing about it, I mean, if I do anything, um, you know, I, I, it, it, it never occurred to me that, that um, you know, that I should just have factories send me up samples and I smoke them and tell them, okay, pick this one for me and let's put a band in a box. And, you know, I, it just, just never occurred. Though that was offered to me once I started investigating, hey, I want to start my own cigar. I called a few companies and uh, at that time, uh, you know, maybe they do now, a, a number of companies had private label programs where they'll have cigars that, you know, that they make as private labels. Maybe it's a cigar that they even have on the shelf already, but it's just, you know, kind of sort of these canned sort of blends that they have. And they say, hey, we'll put you know, your band on it, but, you know, and I wasn't remotely interested in that. For me, it's like, okay, if I want to make cigars, then I damn well better go to the place where they make the cigars, right? Like that, that, that just, for me, that-, that was Logical, was yeah. Yeah, so, but by doing that, I mean, uh, I learned a lot early on. I mean, that, that week I was there in Nicaragua, man, it was just like, it was, I, mean, I literally, that's when I literally came up with the name for my company. I had a, a different name for the brand uh, before that, um, but it, it, it was almost a-, a Can you share? Moment. Can you share what it was? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Trade, trademark <laughs> issue or? <laughs> no, no, no. At, at this time, it was almost embarrassing. I would not share. It, 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 it was, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to share. It was, it was embarrassing. <laughs> like, like, and I'm not easily embarrassed. I was embarrassed. But, um, um, but just being there, man, like, like I was just so just, just taken with um, all the things that went into making a cigar was just like, just mind blowing to me. Like mind blowing, man. Like um, I remember uh, went to uh, uh, Placencia's uh, uh, farm, one of his farms. And I don't remember if this was the, couldn't have been the first day I was there because we were at the factory. Maybe the second day, we start early in the morning and, um, you know, guys come to the hotel to pick us up. We're going to go out to the, uh, to the Finca. And we pull up and you kind of go through this, this, this bluff, you know, this brush of these trees and go to this little bridge and you, you, you get, uh, uh, you know, to where you see the, the, the tobacco field. And I remember we first got, you know, uh, to where I could see the fields, um, I saw these figures and then I saw the figures disappear, like kind of hid a little bit. I'm like, I just I saw people out there. Uh, and then I would see them and then they would disappear. Um, and I mean, it's just 16 years later, 15 years later, so I guess it's okay to say it, but um, I inquired about, like, I just saw people. Well, it turns out those people were kids, right? And this was like, you know, this wasn't summer, right? This is like, it would be a school day for us, right? And there were kids out there with us, like, you know. Um, and it was like, well, uh, and I don't imagine it's still the same now uh, because of the, the association and, and so forth. But, um, you know, I, I just it just dawned on me. I was in an underdeveloped country where it wasn't a foregone conclusion that kids were even going to go to school, right? Like, so these kids were working in tobacco fields. And, 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 and you know, and this was like, a good thing for them because it was it was it was you know income and whatever to, to support them. So it, it was just a, such a stark you know uh, contrast what I was used to and you know and at the time I mean the country's come a long way um, but you know you, you see 
houses with no windows. Like it's a house, you know, it's center block house, but there's no windows. Like it, there's a window, but there's no window frame, right? There's an opening, but there's no window frame. Houses with dirt floors and, and uh, you know, just just um, a level of, 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 of you know, poverty and, 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 and need uh, in some instances that I had never seen personally, right? Um, but whatever the case was from an economic standpoint or, 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 or an infrastructure standpoint, the amount of um, you know, meticulous care that went into growing tobacco, making cigars was just mind blowing, right? Um, you know, going into the Placentia factory at the time, uh, just you know, the, the, the conditions in the factory were pristine, you can eat off the floor, it's so orderly and organized. Uh, um, um, just learning how long it actually took from the time that they planted a seed to the time we burned a cigar was just incredible to me. Uh, and that was under normal circumstances. It's even it's exponentially longer if it's if it's a special project that they're they're going to age or do something with. Um, you know, and just it just, just so much went into it was just like like just amazing to me the amount of of, of, of care and the number of people that were involved in making something that we're going to burn up for an hour. It was just, it was almost, like I said, it was just a, a spiritual awakening, awakening almost. That's why my, my, my brand was called the first world because it was, it was an homage to, um, you know, it's easy for us to sort of dismiss some of these countries at the time as third world countries or undeveloped countries. But when it came to cigars and tobacco, they're the first world. So that's why my, my, my brand was called El Gran Mundo, the first world. I mean, that, that's, that's how impactful that experience was for me. So just, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. I don't think I've ever heard that story about it. That's and that's funny. I've been following for a long time. I don't think I've ever heard that story. That's awesome. I, yeah. um, you know, to kind of to I I told you we're kind of jumping around in timelines here, but to kind of yeah, jump boy. ahead um, to now, you know, 2017, uh, you are now the the you're now with Cohiba and. Um, so what was the, okay, so Blue had just launched uh, right before you started. And so the, was Spectre the first, the, the ushering in of the Sean Williams era? Or was there something before that I, I just, I, that I miss? Silencio. Okay, yeah, your signature blend. Okay. Yeah, 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 Silencio. Um, and the thought behind that was something you alluded to earlier, sort of, what I had been known for as, as a cigar maker was really more Nicaraguan tobacco. So Silencio sort of served as kind of um, a statement of sorts, or 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 a marker of sorts of of, of sort of the, the sort of the, the coming together of ideologies. Um, Cohiba, uh, as I smoked this Cameroon wrapper, um, was known for Cameroon leaf. And political bottle. That's that's like that's signature uh, stuff throughout a lot of the blends. Uh, I was known for you know Nicaraguan tobacco. So Silencio sort of represents sort of kind of the a culmination of those things uh, with the Jalapa Valley Nicaraguan wrapper. You have uh, uh, Esteli and a filler Nicaraguan, but you also have political bottle and the binder is Cameroon. So it's kind of just like this sort of you know uh, blend of 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 these sort of um, you know, profiles that that I brought to the table uh, um, along with what Cohiba was known for. So that was sort of the first one. And um, and again, to, to, to this day, it's not a blend that we sell. Uh, if, 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 if I'm ever fortunate enough to, to, to meet, um, you know, you guys at, you know, events and so forth, then my cigars are available there, the Silencio that is. Um, or if we meet and I give you one, that, 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 that's the only way you really get it. We did a, a holiday release where we had uh, four Silencio or five Silencio. And, 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 and a holiday gifts, a special release. It's not something that's ever on the price sheet. So that was the first cigar. Uh, Inspector uh, 2018 was the second cigar. The the uh, going going back to when you kind of jumped in with both feet though in 2006. Um, you know, I, I have this. Uh, you know, one thing comes to mind when I was talking to a lot of folks and saying that I was going to have you on my show. Uh, I had this, I had several people uh, say this to me about you. Um, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting quote. I'm wondering, because, um, and someone said it in the chat earlier this evening, that, that, that you, you exude this humble nature. 
um, kind of like what we're talking about with your mentor, Eddie Robinson, right? Um, but uh, the quote is from most from people that describe you is is you're the coolest guy in the industry. Um, so okay. in this, so in in the story that you recanted about smoking a cigar on a cruise ship in 2005, I have this vision. Please tell me you were wearing like a tux. <laughs> I was not. Wearing oh that. man, I I just have this vision of you, just like almost like you know James Bond uh, in a tuxedo smoking a, a Fuente, right? Yeah, a Fuente was yeah, your first no, cigar. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Fuente was my first Fuente Double Chateau, I think. Yeah, yeah, first cigar. But <laughs> I, I just had this, I had this vision in my mind. I was like, that'd be really cool if that, if that was, if that was accurate. Um, so, so, you know, again, fast forward, you know, again to when you kind of jump in with both feet differently. Like you said, your approach is a lot different um, with uh, with Cohiba and everything. Um, you know, was it was it important for you? Uh, to with Silencio and then with Spectre and then subsequent releases since then to really make sure that your again uh, your signature is, is now left on every single thing that uh, that comes that comes out of the brand I don't know if, I don't know if I phrase it that way like my signature is left on everything but 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 was it important to 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 import um, impart um, you know sort of my 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 palette and 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 sort of profile leanings, absolutely, yes, absolutely. And and that wasn't so much just um, some you know um, ego thing or whatever. Um, but I, I you know I, I saw a, saw a, a clear opportunity. Like if you're going to build on a brand, um, you know, as 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 uh, um, ever present in the marketplace, as you know, so pervasive in the marketplace as Cohiba. Um, how do you expand the brand? Um, you know, you don't you want to grow, but you don't want to cannibalize what you may already have in the marketplace, right? I don't want to step on Red Dot. Um, you know, I don't want to step on Cleveland Black, uh, which have been stalwarts for the brand for forever. Um, so it kind of worked out that that was sort of an easy way to sort of expand the profile of the brand uh, because that that was that was. Um, sort of where I, I had a lot of experience, right? Um, so it, it worked out that way. Um, so that so so it was it was important. So it it, it was it was a, it was a um, uh, sort of a, a, a you know a, a brand spectrum decision, um, uh, along with you know making sure that that um, if I'm going to come to the table, then then you know uh, I certainly should um, you know offer some uh, influence as, as, as to, to, to what the new blends are gonna, uh, you know, what the, what the experience with the new blends are gonna be. So, so, that, so it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, it was, you know, sort of two sort of um, opportunities that sort of, you know, um, dovetailed pretty nicely. So, so that kind of goes into my next question. It's a two part question here, Sean. It kind of goes back to the decision to leave behind El Premier Mundo and uh, and head up Cohiba. What did you know? You know when you when you started. What did you know that you could bring to Cohiba? And what did you know that you what did you know that you had to leave behind as you entered into this next chapter of your cigar making life? Well, I knew I could bring passion to have passion in a brand without um, somebody physically that you can interact with that, that conveyed the passion. So that's sort of the big thing. Um, um, I knew that I could, I could, I could bring passion to the brand and just personalize it and, 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 and tell the story, uh, not just see an ad or, or, but, but just interact with, with other cigar lovers like me and kind of tell them, you know, why the brand is what it is and what's special about it. So that's the biggest thing, just kind of bringing a voice to it more than anything. Um, and as far as what I left behind, um, <laughs> Um, I don't know that I left let's see what I left behind. Um, you know, I I, I I I guess when I think of terms of left behind, I think of terms like maybe you think that uh um what's the word? Um some of the 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 I don't know how to explain this, man. Um some of the simpler um, sort of things. There's there's a 
there's a lot of decisions that go into, uh, or a lot of um, considerations that goes into to decisions as it relates to to a brand like Cohiba. There, there, there's a lot more on the line. Um, you know, so what I left, left behind was just sort of uh, uh, the ability to, to to do something just like that, right? Um, you know, you want to do a special project, and you know, you're the guy, small brand. You know, um, you come across something at a factory. Um, you know, as far as uh, um, you know, maybe Miami Stash, which is a cigar that that I had, I had no hand in blending, but I'm at Titan the Bronze working on something else. And talking to Sandy, and and I don't know how the conversation came up, but she has these cigars that she had made for another project that somebody didn't use. I smoked them and loved them, so okay, let's do this quick release. So what I left behind was just sort of uh, uh, the, the, the simple uh, um, um, sort of decisioning process and the ability to, to, to pivot instantly and, and so forth. And, and I kind of missed those things in a, in, in a sense. Um, but you know, I, I left behind a little independence as it relates to that. You know, uh, but nothing that, you know, I'm thinking, my, I, I'm not, you know, pining for, you know, the ability to go back to that or whatever. But, you know, those things are kind of cool. Yeah, those things are kind of cool. So, but, you know, for, 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 the, for the good of the team, um, you know, I mean, everybody, you know, should, 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 you know, make some sort of sacrifices, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, uh, but uh, accommodations. Everybody should make some accommodations for the good of the team, especially if the mission makes sense and it's a, and it's a mission that's bigger than you. And, and for me, the 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 the, the overall uh, the brand is bigger than me, uh, the Cleveland brand. And, and and if for some reason uh, I'm not sitting here talking to you next year, then uh, my mission is to make sure that I left the brand better off than than when I walked through the door. Well, I certainly hope that's not the case. And uh, but if but if that were the case, uh, I can I can definitely say uh, that is so. Um, I think you have. Um, but you know, so it sounds like um, it's a it's a different type of a different type of responsibility, right? You know, um, it you know it you have a responsibility to yourself with your own brand and and. Um, and the sacrifices that you make are no less important mm -hmm. or no less, um, you no mess, uh, no less in to degree. Uh, they're just different. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we transition to this next question, I, I do want to apologize uh, to you, Sean, and my audience a little bit. I'm having a little bit of internet uh, instability here, so I just want to apologize if you guys are experiencing any delays. Uh, I, I am sorry about that. That's I don't on. Know if that's you or me. Um, my signal, for some reason, is not uh, uh, the best, um, and, and I've got the you know internet unstable thing, uh, so that may be on my end. So I, I, I apologize, and hopefully, it's not too. Uh, no, it, it, no, it's it's it, it's still pretty good, and I, I think I think I, well, we might be sharing on this. So I, I um, something I for, uh, pardon me for the unprofessionalism here, everybody, but uh, I do want to point out, Sean, if if my connection does sever, um, if your connection severs, obviously you can can jump back in, but if my connection severs, uh, you you will still be on, and I will be able to rejoin as well. So just just hang in there, audience, hang in there. If if something happens, my audience unfortunately has experienced this before with me. I. Uh, my hundredth episode, I had Pete Johnson on, and uh, my uh, there was a thunderstorm outside, and it decided to just kill, kill my power. Oh, and, dude, and I so, was doing my nightcap with Cohiba one night, and we got a blackout in the neighborhood. That was, <laughs> that was weird. That was weird. You know, yeah, I, I, I had a game plan for that. So, yeah. So no, you're so no stranger to 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 working on the fly there. So That's I, I, I we, 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 this is a new age, man. Like like we we we've. we've uh, you know, we had a lot of curveballs this year, so you just kind of roll with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so I want to talk about this, um, this la the latest project uh, from from Cohiba, the okay. the Royale. Um, again, uh, imparting your your own blending style, your own signature. Again, this is me talking, not you, with the Nicaraguan Jalapa wrapper. Now, what I found really interesting about this project, and um, Forgive me. I've yet to have, I've yet to have actually sampled one, but I've I've heard nothing but rave reviews about it. Um, is that this is the first this is the first Cohiba to be manufactured in Honduras? Yes, um, at the Hatsa factory. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
so in a way, before you kind of get into the nuts and bolts of Royale, Sean, in a way, is is this is this ex latest expression from Cohiba uh, representative of your own journey in the cigar industry? I mean, you worked with the Placencias, you worked with Abe Flores, you worked with Eric Espinosa. I mean, you, like I said before, built up this incredible network and valuable relationships that helped you produce amazing cigars along the way. Uh, are you just translating that differently over to with Cohiba being able to tap into all the arenas that you can now? Um, I, I do like working with, with different factories. Um, simple reason is, man, you, you can take the exact same tobacco. You can take the same blend. Uh, this, the, 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 the same uh, tobaccos in, included in any cigar blend. And if they're uh, processed and treated in different factories, you're going to get different expressions. So I do like that. And I learned something every factory that I work with. Uh, in particular, with, with Royale, I was... Um, uh, interested in doing this cigar at, at the Hatsa factory, which is uh, which is our largest cigar factory as far as general cigar. And uh, and depending on who you depending on who you ask, the largest cigar factory in the world. There's a debate whether it's us or, or, or La Romana, but um, you know it, it's still it's it's a, it's a mammoth factory. Um, but does gangster stuff, dude, gangster stuff. Um, and I wanted to do this cigar there in particular because of the components that that that, that are part of it. In particular, uh, Jalapa Valley tobacco. Hamastron Valley tobacco from Honduras. Um, and this factory is in Donnelly, Honduras, which sits at the cusp of the, the Hamastron Valley. And they're intimately familiar with working with these leaves. Um, not that the DR isn't, um, but this is sort of, um, and it's a different sort of approach to, to, to the way that they process it. it, it, it they make fuller, full, fuller body expressions there, uh, but also with, with, with great balance. But the big things is they, they, they are just, 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 of all the factories, just a lot more familiar with um, those tobaccos and 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 how they work together. Um, and and there's a certain familiarity with me having made cigars in Nicaragua, and, and I never made cigars in Honduras, but but I've been using Hamastron Valley tobacco for for years. Uh, the Placentias have a place there. So so just overall, it's kind of full circle with 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 familiarity familiarity with me with that region. Uh, and also uh, specifically with with that factory, uh, just just having a lot of experience with uh, with the components that we use in, in Royale. So that's why it was important to do it there. It's really awesome. So when you uh, when you first started this project, what was the uh, you, you mentioned cannibalizing, and I've heard that term quite a bit from a number of my guests over the last. Uh, you know, the last 152 takes, they don't want to cannibalize their brand in one way or another, but you have a different, you have that responsibility. Yes. But you have another responsibility as well, because you have so many other brother and sister brands in the general portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so when you approached this project in developing Royale, what was the, the impetus, of, the impetus of it? What were you, what were you going for? And did you, do you feel like you ultimately achieved it with what resulted in Royale? Yeah. So I wanted to do something. I wanted to push the the, the uh, push the, the the body up in the profile a little bit. Um, you know, we don't. You know, Cohiba's not. You know, we're not known for like super mild cigars, right? So that that's you know um, that that's not our, not our place. Um, overall, medium body, uh, fuller body expressions. Uh, previously, it included uh, Cohiba Nicaragua. Cohiba Black, which is a real classic Maduro. Um, and so really, as it stood in the portfolio, the Cohiba Nicaragua was the fullest cigar that we had, um, which I love that cigar, by the way. Um, you know, I wanted to do stuff that has an Oscuro wrapper, really, really uh, highlights more Esteli tobacco, more kind of spice, um, you know, a little bit more raw uh, um, uh, in its profile. Um, so I wanted something that was, was going to offer uh, maybe a little bit more body, but I wanted something that was going to be a smokier, uh, more sort of uh, 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 chocolatey expression. Um, so that that was kind of the thought behind it. Just just you know, offer um, something that, that gives you more of that Nicaraguan cigar experience. But I wanted a little bit more refined. But I I, I wanted it to be uh, a full body cigar, but but refined. Um, so that was kind of the 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 the, the, the process. 
And then, you know, this also came after, you know, a couple of years ago, Silencio being the first, you know, cigar that, that I worked with with Cohiba that sported a Jalapa Valley wrapper. Cigar You're Smoking Now sports a Jalapa Valley wrapper. And the response to both those cigars have been just tremendous, but neither of those cigars are regular production. Silencio, you only get if we do an event or if you met me or something like that. Spectre, obviously we made 300 box of that and it's gone. Um, so uh, I, I recognize that there is an audience for that wrapper. So that was one of the, the, the reasons uh, I looked to make Royale to really give uh, a vehicle for that wrapper as well. And, and it just makes sense to do that in Honduras. So it, it kind of occurred to me, so that you're, you know, Silencio, very exclusive uh, blend that you offer out. You know, Spectre, incredibly exclusive. Um, Cohiba White, you know, um, Connecticut. Connecticut, excuse me, uh, can you, uh, is, uh, you know, a foray that, you know, an expression that's, you know, in, in terms of price point is above the $20 mark. Royale is near $30 mark. I mean, you, these are price points that you never touched on with El Premier Mundo. Um, you know, but Cohiba is, is, is completely different than obviously what you were doing, uh, with your own, with your own branding. Uh, you know, when you kind of, you know, was it, was it difficult to kind of shoulder this, this responsibility of not just, not just, not just heading up the, one of the most iconic brands, but, you know, leaping from boutique to a more luxury staple in the humidor. Um, I don't know if I look at it as a leap, um, because it's sort of like they, they, it's not like they ever competed, right? Um, and, and nobody would confuse Cohiba with being a boutique cigar. Um, but my whole thing was, I want to take that mindset, that sort of boutique mindset, that sort of, um, um, you know, keep your hands busy, you know, stay hungry. Um, you're always looking for, you know, how can we push the envelope? Like, like that, that sort of, sort of guerrilla warfare approach that, that you have in, in the boutique world um, to Cohiba, um, you know, in the luxury space, with the resources that 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 we have, um, and, and and I think that that's been you know sort of a, a key component. We're really just sort of pushing the 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 the, the, the spectrum out a little bit as far as what, what we offer. Um, and 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 honestly, I don't really um, I don't really not that I don't get involved in a price. Um, I I don't put that into the equation necessarily. Um, you know, um, and and I also don't have any misgivings about uh, why our cigars cost what they cost what cost what they what they do. I mean, I know what you know what it what it takes the time involved in aging a cigar in Tercios. I know what you know what goes into you know packaging. You know the Royale packaging. I mean, you know, this, 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 you know this stuff isn't isn't um, it isn't the same. You know, plain cedar coffin boxes that, that, you know, I, I, I use for legal Miami. Right. Um, you know, and people say, well, it's just a package doesn't matter. Well, that, that's all a part of the experience. Right. Um, you know, listen, I mean, you know, you, you, you worked in a retail store and, and you can tell me probably more times than you can remember how many times, uh, the band on a cigar sold a cigar. Right. So all that's a part of it. And, uh, and speaking of that, I mean, we, we, we've gone through uh, a major overhaul of the look of Cohiba over the last few mm -hmm. years to, to really, really update the packaging and, 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 and just offer, you know, a, it's all a part of it, man. When you get into, you know, the, the, the opening, you know, the, 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 you know, everybody talks about, you know, the unboxing and whatever, and, and, and all that comes into play, you know what I mean? You know, so, you know, there's a reason why, you know, you put the time into, into developing packaging and giving people an experience and giving people something that 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 they want to you know have in, in their uh in their humidor and and gift to people and and hold on to i mean especially if it, it you know in, in instances of a cigar like a Spectre or even a royale for that matter um you know royale is an, isn't an everyday smoke for most people for, for many people it's a celebratory smoke or 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 it's something that they want to want to have and hold so you want to make sure that the experience uh, uh, from start to finish makes sense. Just like when you're when you're about to smoke a cigar. I mean, as, as cigar lovers, we enjoy the the cutting of a cigar. 
the toasting of the foot, taking in the room note, you know, all that, ha we enjoy all that, that's sort of unpacking this experience before we put a cigar to our mouth. And um, the packaging of a cigar should, should sort of be the same experience, you know, when you're spending this type of money. So, um, you know, it's really just about just creating, you know, a, a great cigar with great tobacco, but you want the experience to be special. So, so there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of moving parts to it. So, um, you know, I have no qualms about what the cigars cost. Uh, and certainly when, when I know what goes into it, you know, something as simple, you know, we overlook the, the red dot a, a lot, but, you know, there's not many companies that have authentic Cameroon wrapper from the Congo Republic of Africa. I know because Jeremiah Mirafel and, and, and our buddies, we, we've talked about, it. we talked about, you know, uh, uh, a time when they couldn't produce Cameroon wrapper out of the Congo Republic for a number of socioeconomic and safety concerns. Uh, and there were, there were only a few companies that could really, really put up the resources to make sure that the cigar world had access to this tobacco. You know, mm -hmm. Cameroon Leaf is the pound for pound, the most expensive commercially available wrapper on the planet. Connecticut Broadleaf is second. So there's cost that goes into this stuff and there's a lot of time that goes into it. So um, yeah, I didn't have any issues making a leap from it because I knew that the vehicle that I was in before, um, you know, operated in sort of a certain space with certain resources and certain materials. That's not Cohiba. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, man, it, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's like anything, right? Um, you know, you, you have to have to make sure that that it's not about price or cost. Ultimately, it's about value. And 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 I can stand behind the value of, of, of what Cohiba is because I know what goes into it from from the passion uh, 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 to the product to the packaging. I mean, it, it, there's there's a lot that goes into it. And 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 we don't throw anything out um, as far as just throwing stuff out in the market just to put it on the market. Mm -hmm. It's all well thought out. I mean, this year coming up, we're not releasing any regular, regular production stuff because, um, you know, where we are uh, right now, uh, as far as our portfolio, it doesn't warrant it. You know, we're not going to put something out just because we got to put something out new every year. Um, we want to make sure that we can stand behind it. There's passion that goes into it. Um, you know, we work on some cool stuff. And if, if we look at, you know, sort of the landscape and say, Hey, we don't, you know, this, I, I don't see where we have any holes in the portfolio to where we want to put out a regular production cigar right now. Um, then let's put out some stuff that's special that people can really get behind and enjoy and, 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 and make it make sense. So, yeah. So, um, prices are a little bit higher, but, but I think the value in it makes sense for what it is. No, I, I certainly agree. And I, I, it was, I, it was very humbling of you a minute ago to say like how you, you don't necessarily come up with the packaging. You, you, you have a hand in it, as you mentioned, but, uh, yeah. I, I feel like the new packaging, yeah, but, it has your fingerprints like everywhere. It's, 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 it's not going to go, that's for sure. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, we 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 have uh, some terrific uh, uh, design people internally, and uh, and also we have some some people externally that that, that we use to design packaging and, and produce and so forth. So, um, you know, not all. You know, this 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 was 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 designed by by an agency. The, the overall uh, uh, overhaul, the the overall design of Royale was given to us by somebody else. It's actually a patented design for the box but the boxes produced at our factory in Honduras. So there's different ways that we go about it. It's just, it, it just comes down to what, what makes sense. And, and that was a learning process for me. And it's a great process because, you know, you, you, you get different schools of thought, different approaches to packaging. And sometimes it's good to, to, to maybe work with uh, somebody who has an eye for design who doesn't have a background in cigars because instinctively as a cigar uh, maker or a cigar guy, you kind of look at it a certain way um, just from, you know, how the cigars are going to be uh, um, uh, sort of cradled on the inside, but there's a lot of elements uh, on the outside, the little things that that kind of uh, make a design pop that I wouldn't necessarily see. Um, so it's been it's been a fun process, man. It really has. Yeah, they certainly have your fingerprints all over them. I, I really, I just, I I'm a huge fan of what you guys oh, you. put in. Thank it's you. terrific. So I, I've I've wanted to, Sean. I got to ask you I'm, this next question, and I, forgive me. I, I it, it, it may be a little polarizing, but I, I've wanted to ask this question about, uh, about a number of people, but I, I see, it seems to be appropriate for you specifically because of, and we talked about your mentor, Eddie, one, of, one of your mentors, Eddie Robinson, and he, this is a man of, of, of great accomplishment that certainly had failures and successes um, you know, throughout his, his illustrious career. 
and you've certainly had failures and successes. I would say that, um, I would say that your successes have vastly outnumbered your failures. Um, I, I can't even think of, and I'm not just saying this because you're sitting across from me, but I can't think of many failures, but I'm sure you could name some if you wanted to. Okay. But here's my, but here's my question. I don't want you to list off any failures. I, I, I want to ask this question of you. Have you, have you ever been afraid of failure? Uh, yeah, man. Um, yeah, all the time. Um, and I'm not afraid to a point where, where it, it paralyzes you, whatever, but, um, yeah, man. Um, afraid of, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, but in what context, I, I guess is the question afraid to the point where, where I've done something. I'm like, Oh shit, what have I done? This is not going to work um or afraid to try afraid of failure to the point where i didn't try something that's a different thing it's true it's an open-ended question i just i was yeah. you, you, you just answer, yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah I'm, I'm i'm afraid of, you know of, of failure and, and and i i think i think that for me um i kind of embrace that fear because for me that 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 that, that, that keeps me that keeps my head on a swivel so to speak right that keeps me you know um uh, i don't get comfortable I don't get comfortable, right? Um, but I am I am absolutely more afraid of not trying than I am afraid of failure. Absolutely. It's really funny. I, I, w I wish I could show you my show notes. I actually had a feeling that you would answer that in that kind of similar context. I just, I, 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 I think... Uh, when I look at you and when I think about your career arc and when I think about you as a person, I, I think of a, of a man who respects failure, learns from it, Absolutely. Um, but doesn't, doesn't, do, again, to your, to your words, doesn't, it doesn't paralyze them. It doesn't, it doesn't hinder them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I expect that. And, 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 uh, and you learn, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you don't, you don't learn. I, I think about, uh, as it relates to, uh, um, I have uh, I have three daughters. My oldest daughter is uh, is, and I'm I'm looking at my battery. I may have to run and get a cord because uh, I wasn't thinking. It says 42 minutes, but that's never right. Um, but I think about my daughters. My oldest daughter is 29. My youngest daughter is 12. My oldest daughter was born when when I was in my early 20s and uh, broken in Cuda Brown, right? And uh, you know, so she got the best of what I had at the time, right? Um, you know, so her uh, upbringing was, was, was a bit different than my daughter who's 12 years old now. Um, and it's like her whole life is like this, 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 this one big world of cushioned walls kind of, you know, like, like, um, you know, I just think about, you know, I mean, I grew up single mom, um, you know, four boys and, and, uh, you know, I was, you know, you know, my mom would give me like, you know, a uh, task of going to pay, you know, certain bills. I mean, I would get on a, you know, city bus by myself at, you know, nine and 10 years old. Dude, my daughter could barely cross a, 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 a busy street. Like, you know, like if you put her like, <laughs> in downtown Atlanta, right? You know, so so I think about that, like, like man, you know, and I just heard just, 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 just uh, even kids older than like, like are, are, are we allowing these kids to fail enough? Because you got to fail in life. Like you got to get knocked on your ass, you know, you know, to know that, okay, well I survived that. All right, let me get back up. Like, you know, so, uh, and that's just how I think of things. Like um, I expect that I'm going to fail at some things, but I also expect that I'm going to learn from some, from some, from some things, you know? And, and the only thing that, 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 that I regret when I lose it is time. I, I you know, I've, I've, you know, I've, you know, you know, I, I, if I lose, you know, relationships and people I love, that's different. But I mean, as far as in the confines of business, like, um, you know, I don't necessarily worry about products failing. I mean, I made mistakes with that. I've certainly lost money in, in, in business, not just in cigars. Uh, but even with that, I take it in stride. And it's like, okay, still breathing, still got time. Let's go. You know, so that's, that's the only, uh, 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 as it relates to sort of business and, and, and professionally, the, the, the most important commodity to me is time. You know, uh, anything else, man? Um, you know, I, I don't regret losing or failing. So. Awesome. 
Well, I think that's a great segue into our, our next segment here, Sean. So why don't I, why don't I give you a, a second to go grab that cord just in case. And, uh, and I really want to, just thank my audience for tuning in tonight for right. our no problem for our 150 second take. Uh, we're live here with Sean Williams uh, of Cohiba Cigars, um, and just a fantastic story so far. And I, I if you guys have uh, showed up late, I encourage you to rewind, kind of listen to the first half of tonight's show. Um, as Sean's kind of coming back, uh, he's going to be plugging in here in a moment, and uh, we're going to be kind of going into the next half of this. And uh, you know, he was just talking about. I, I, I've wanted to ask that question to a number of people, and I thought tonight was appropriate simply because, um, you know, that descriptor that I had, had laid on him earlier is a cigar is a is a is a label that was given to me by several, uh, not just one, um, but several people in the industry who have a, a huge respect for this man that I happen to be sitting across from tonight, uh, calling him the coolest man in the industry. Um, and there has to be, you know, the, you know, this is a man who uh, obviously has felt pressure in his career. He's obviously dealt with pressure and he's, he, uh, he built up a brand from, from scratch. And now he's uh, now he is leading the way for one of the most iconic brands in the industry. Uh, so something really, really exciting about uh, talking with Sean Williams tonight. It's a, an absolute pleasure, pleasure to bring him to you. So I'm really excited uh, to share his story with you um, a little bit along the way. So um, thank you for tuning in. We're, 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 we're still going here. He's, uh, he's powering up. He's getting a cord. And we're going to go in tonight's uh, One Must Go segment. Um, so tonight's One Must Go segment, as always, is uh, brought to you by United Cigars, featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron lines. Smoke one today and start living united. Uh, so, Sean, welcome back. We, um, we, were talking, we were talking about the One Must Go segment before the, uh, before the show, and I, I, I try to always mold this around my guest. And uh, so the idea is I pose you with three things and one's got to go. Mm. And um, I, knowing, the, knowing the love and respect for, that you have for the way you grew up in New Orleans, you're a New Orleans kid. I know you, you spent time in LA too, but you, uh, you know, New Orleans is home. Uh, now Atlanta's home, but New Orleans is where uh, is New where Orleans the is always home. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I know you're, I know you're, you're a big fan of food. And you like you like a steak as much as the rest of us, as I've heard before. But uh, but food is kind of where it's at. So I thought that the, New Orleans is home to many iconic cuisines, many iconic foods, and sure. I love I love New Orleans and I love New Orleans food specifically. So I thought it would be it would be apropos to actually talk about three iconic New Orleans foods, and now one's got to go. Now this is just for fun. It doesn't mean you're actually gonna you know cease and desist from ever having and enjoying it again so here are your three new orleans foods and one's got to go okay so okay. here we go po boys okay. number one gumbo number two mm-hmm. and beignets it's number three so which beignets. one's got to go and why beignets, gotta go. beignets so quickly okay i mean that's easy i mean i i literally made gumbo tonight so like <laughs> 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 like, like, I literally made gumbo tonight to watch to watch the. Uh, the oh, show. that's funny. And that's funny. and and I never ever 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 go to New Orleans and not get a po' boy like ever. Um, so, um, for me, uh, beignets I like. Um, but you know, I, that's kind of an experience thing. I mean, I haven't had a beignet, man. And uh, man, the last time I had a beignet. I think the last time I had a beignet was actually here in Atlanta, probably two years ago. Um, okay. But a beignet in New Orleans, uh, I'm guessing maybe 15 years, maybe. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, and I enjoy beignets, uh, but man, the, the powder and the whatever, I don't mind a beignet, but yeah, I mean, if I'm going to have a, a, a pastry, uh, 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 or something sweet in New Orleans, bign- beignets may not be like like I'm I'm going to do like a, you know bread pudding in New Orleans or oh okay pralines or or you know or chest cake uh, or, or you know yeah so so beignets that's easy beignets have to, would have to go so I can live without beignets can't live without gumbo gumbo or po' boys though so king cake over beignets too or just 
Well, but King Cake is once a year, right? Um, right. But yes, yes, uh, yes. G- give Even the King choice. Cake over. Okay. If, if someone came in right now and is like, hey, you want to, uh, you know, you can only pick one, Beignet, King Cake, King Cake all of it. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. I didn't think this was going to be that easy. That's, that's, just, see, these are the, these are the three, di- every time I go to New Orleans, these are the three dishes I have to have. I have to have, I have to, I'm, I'm with you. My first stop is always a po' boy. Always. Where do you get po' boys at in New Orleans though? Um, so I always kind of, I always kind of talk to, I'm, I'm not from not, New Orleans. Whatever least, happens, do not say mothers. I will end this feed right now. <laughs> I've been there, but uh, no, no. So I, I usually, what I like to do whenever I go to a city and especially one like New Orleans, Philadelphia, Miami, yeah. um, you know, that have, you know, iconic foods. I always ask whoever I happen to be with, like, hey, where, where, where should I go? So I've, I've, I've kind of been to, I, I've been kind of, path. yeah, yeah, I've been to some holes in the wall and, and, and really enjoyed some really good po' yeah. boys. And, and uh, uh, I have been to mothers. Um, and, and I will tell you, I, I kind of agree with that statement. It was, it was it, honestly, I, I think it was probably, if memory serves me right, I, I enjoyed it, but I, I think that there were definitely some better ones. Yeah, no, I, get, get, getting a po' boy at mothers is like getting a cheesesteak at Pat's in Philly. It's just, you know, yeah. So, no offense to anybody that likes cheesesteak and pats and Philly, but if you do, you you don't know cheesesteak. Anyway. <laughs> well, so so seafood. So I know that seafood is kind of like what you gravitate towards in general, right? That's kind of like your that's your bread and butter. Yeah, um, I, I love seafood. Yeah, um, yeah, I love seafood. I don't know. I don't know if that if that's. I don't know if I have a bread and butter actually. I mean, I, I eat man, I eat everything. So, um, yeah, I, I probably should eat more seafood, but. You know, obviously here I don't really get um, golf seafood, which I really, you know, it's not, you know, uh, a lot of places outside of New Orleans. If you know, if, if you know, if I'm in, um, you know, here or North Carolina, and there's redfish on the menu, most times it's not redfish; it's black drum. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so to get really good golf seafood, um, what I really like, uh, I don't eat uh, oysters on a half shell anywhere outside of New Orleans. Um, so I can't always get the seafood that I grew up with, obviously. But yeah, I, I, I love I love seafood. Yeah, but man, I love I love a nice steak too. But I probably honestly, um, especially now since COVID, I mean, I haven't really uh, um, um, had an opportunity. To really, I think I probably had two steaks since 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 you know since the spring, uh, because I really enjoy you know I mean I could grill here at home a steak, but it's just not I enjoy the the sort of steakhouse experience, you know. Uh, so if that's if that's you know not something I can really really uh, uh, enjoy in its in its full nature, then then you know I'm, I'm I'm not as inclined to have a steak, but I love a, a good steak. And there's certain places I go for certain steaks that I like uh, here locally at least, um, you know. And you know, love chicken. So I mean, yeah, I just I, I like everything. But seafood, that's that's yeah yeah. Seafood is a part. You, you don't grow up in New Orleans. I mean, it is very rare, but you can't grow up in New Orleans and not really be into seafood. It's, it's hard. Yeah, I uh, I I think that uh, some I was talking to a couple of people about the question I was going to pose to you tonight, and they're like, "Oh, you have to say, you know, it's it's not those three. You have to say gumbo jambalaya or etouffee." And I was like, I was like, well, I wanted to kind of that would have been etouffee. Would, would have been third. Would, would have been the one that had to go. I I I agree with that. I'm a much more I'm much more into gumbo and jambalaya than I am etouffee. Uh, I love crawfish. Uh, I just, you oh. know, but yeah. I don't know. Just there's something about there's just something about good jambalaya and good combo over etouffee every time for me personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, okay. Well, that was our that was our one. Thank you, Sean. That was our one must go segment. As always, uh, sponsored by United Cigar. Uh, brought to you by uh, featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolera, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron lines. So smoke one today and start living united. Um, this kind of goes into our next subject, uh, Sean. So you and I were talking a little bit about this offline before tonight's show, and and this is a newer segment to LLC from our takes. Uh, it's something that I brought on in my birthday, um, late October, first one was early November, where I've been asking my guests uh, to feature a nonprofit or charity of their choice that they want to bring awareness to and, and talk about and potentially raise money for. Um, and so I was really, really excited uh, to, to to get your take on this. And, and, uh, and then you were talking to me a little bit about how you typically, uh, how you and your wife have done it is you, 
you, you guys personally invest in, in your own, in your own, uh, in families and in your own way, you guys do this, you have a very personal take on it, but, but you did bring about a great organization that I've just recently learned about, didn't know anything about them until you brought them up. So I'm really excited to talk about them tonight. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction, but I'd love for you to talk about why it's important to you. And that uh, charity, of course, is Seven Bridges to Recovery. Now, this is a great local organization to Atlanta um, that focuses, uh, in, a, in a very broad general term, focuses on the homeless uh, there in, um, in Atlanta. And uh, it's run by a, uh, uh, by a man who's a, 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 former, a former convict, if, I, if I'm able, labeling correctly, but he really, uh, I mean, took the expression, turned over a new leaf and uh, to incredible leaps and bounds with this organization, servicing men, women, and children in the greater Atlanta area. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really, just really excited to hear uh, why Seven Bridges to Recovery is such an important organization to you. Well, um, their center of focus, focus is, is, is around the homeless. And um, I had a, 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 a couple of like very rare, um, I guess, initiatives with, with, with doing stuff with, with the homeless, you know, uh, prior to a few years ago. Uh, I was in college, we did this, this sort of outreach thing where we went to the New Orleans mission and, um, and fed the homeless. And, and that, was, that, was, that was wild, man. I was, I think my junior year and, um, and I'm in this homeless shelter and, um, you know, we get homeless and we just, there, and, and I see this guy uh, that I knew, but he looked a lot skinnier than, 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 than I recognize his face, but he's a lot skinnier than the guy I thought I knew. Well, it turns out this was a guy that I knew um, who actually, my freshman year at Grambling, he was at Grambling with me, played football at Grambling. And um, I, I won't say his name, um, um, but he had left, um, you know, after he was a, maybe it was a junior or so, uh, my, my freshman year, but he had left, you know, we went home for summer, he didn't, he didn't come back. Well, it turns out, I don't remember in which order, but he lost his mother, then his father, maybe vice versa, within, literally within a couple of months. And it just sent him into this tailspin. Ended up, you know, on drugs, whatever, ended up, ended up in home. So that was like a shock to me because I was 2021. 20, so this guy must have been 23, 24. Um, you know, so that was sort of the, 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 the first sort of shock I got of like, you know, how things can 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 kind of go from from good to bad for somebody, and you never know their story. Um, and then fast forward a number of years later, had a, a good friend of mine uh, lives here, Terry Carmen. Um, he and his wife would have this thing where they would do every Christmas morning. We were just kind of talking about what you guys do for holidays as well. He would go around to uh, at the time it was Mrs. Winter's fried chicken. I think most of them have since closed, but he would go around on Christmas Eve. Um, um, to to this one store, and he had worked out with um, with the manager there that you know um, you know most of these places at the end of the night if they have leftover food they got to destroy it and whatever. And he worked out to where he would he would take all of this food and pack up all these bags. And Christmas morning, um, you know most people are opening gifts. He would just go around in downtown Atlanta and just have these bags put together that he would just give out to homeless people so they have a meal for Christmas morning. And nobody knew about it. It's not, you know, everybody's doing stuff on Christmas. It was just something he did. So we started doing that with him. Uh, we did it for a couple of Christmases in a row. But then it was like, okay, well, we do this once a year. Like, you know, like, like what are we really doing? Um, so then we would start doing something similar just randomly. Like, you know, whenever, okay, well, you know, Let's plan it, and we would have a few other families involved, and and um, and and we'll sort of do that. And I don't even remember how we were sort of um, um, clued into um, Seven Bridges. It was it's, it's actually right near a kennel that we used to go to, and I would see the place, but didn't know what it was. And I don't, I'm not sure um, who told us what it was, but but through that we 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 um, got the, the the ability to 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 um, I don't remember if it was a Thanksgiving or Christmas, some holiday, sort of same thing. You go there and 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 feed the homeless. And that from that, once once you I walked in, I was just like blown away. Because again, I'd seen this place and I just thought it was it's actually part of it is is is, is a church that's still functions kind of as a church, but there's a lot of other stuff, you know, attached to it. And I just thought it was like a church that had like these 
auxiliary buildings like some churches do. But I got in there and um, and my daughter was with me, uh, my youngest daughter. And it was, it was, it was the place is literally 10 minutes from my house. And their primary focus uh, is, is women, but women with families. So um, there's actually, I don't know the number, but there, there are dozens and dozens of families there with women and their children. And, uh, and they have these, these, you know, big rooms that they have like these sort of living cubicles arranged um, so that um, the families have some level of privacy. So, you know, you'll have a mother and her child or children in their own little sort of living area. And, and, and they have these, these uh, arrangements all throughout the space. Um, and my daughter actually saw um, a couple of kids that go to school with her and nobody would know that these kids are homeless. Um, so to me, that was, that was, that was great in that, um, you know, the kids were actually, you know, they went to school like, like, uh, normal kids d did and, and, uh, and they had some place of stability, um, you know, and, and the, the mothers would, would have jobs, you know, that they would go to, or they would go out looking for jobs. Like, like it was like, um, they had like, I won't say an apartment, but they had some, some place of stability to live, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and keep themselves together and got dressed and went out and, and tried to function in society every day. Um, and there are some men there and they keep the men separate, obviously from, 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 from the women and most of the women, and I don't, I don't really remember the impetus behind how I started, but I know the initial ministry was, was for, uh, uh battered women and, and, and their children. And that's how it started. So most of, of, of the residents there are, are women and children. There are some men there, but, but it's an ongoing thing. Like they always need clothes. They always need any donations. So we've done, uh, you know, feeding the, 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 the homeless there, you know, bringing clothes. And I'm a big guy. So, uh, so you know, so I, not, my, my clothes won't last long. So I bring stuff <laughs> there and, and there's always somebody, cause you know, they need clothes to, to, to go out and function, look for jobs to go to work and whatever. Um, and they just do this great work and you would just never know it's there. And then, uh, uh seven is the guy, uh, um, that, that, that you're talking about. He has, a um, uh, um, you know, sort of a motorcycle brigade. Like, like if you see this guy, if you didn't know what he, what he was or what he did, you would see him like, you're not going to get sideways with him, right? He's a big guy, you know, <laughs> just kind of, kind of bowed up, um, look like he's lived a life. Um, but he has a bunch of guys and they'll actually, they get on motorcycles too, and they just go like under, uh, the bridges and, 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 you know, these little sort of, you know, ducked off spots and, 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 and minister to the homeless and, and help them out, whatever. So it's, it, it's an ongoing thing. And, um, and it was good for me because it's somewhere that's close to the house. That is something that we can do kind of on, on a regular basis. And we know like, cause you know, th there's always people calling for closed donations or whatever. And we've had few charities where we'll just put together a bag. I really can, can feel, you know, uh, uh, the impact, so to speak, because it's, cl it's close and, and, and it's, it's more personal. So um, it just kind of, you know, um, I don't know, man, it's, it's something easy to do. And, and, and it's, uh, if there's any problem, man, that, that, that I think uh, as, as a country, I mean, we, we, we have a few problems that, that we, 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 we should really work on addressing as a company, uh, as a country, but, but one in particular that, 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 that everybody sees and everybody feels and, and some people really overlook is, is the homelessness in, in America. It's just, uh, it's just, it's staggering, man. It, it is staggering. And, you know, I don't know that, you know, what, what, what I do, or we do as a family, um, you know, moves the needle, but at least I can feel like, I mean, at least that, 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 that's a, that's an organization that's real, literally 10 minutes from my house. It's close. I see what they do. I see the kids, I see the, you know, the bikes, I see the kids playing and it's like a home for, for these people to, to get themselves together. So it's a, it's, 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 it's really, really, um, um, you know, hard work that they're doing. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I feel good that, 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 you know, when we can, we, we, we could impact, um, you know, an, an, an operation like that, that's close to us. Uh, uh, and again, I mean, these kids have, you know, kids there, you know, go to the schools in, in, in our area. Um, and, and so much so that, you know, my daughter was like really blown away because you know, she wouldn't know that, that these kids were homeless and, 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 and these kids are, are functioning and, and hopefully able to, to get out of situations that they're in long term, man. So, you know, that, that's, that's it, you know. What a beautiful organization and what a, what a 
you know, it's it, it's interesting, you know, as I've, I've as I've brought this this question to a number of my guests, and there's, and this is why I do this. This is why I've done this is because there's countless and there's endless causes and organizations that to to bring awareness for, and and but I think you hit on a, a really dark point, um, which is, it, it kind of all starts at home, right? Yeah. You know, the the one of the biggest things is, you know, like you know. So I, I'm rewind, reminded of words of my father who said, you know, you can do a world, you can do a world of good in this world. Um, um, but, it, you know, you need to, you need to look at what's close to home before, you know, you can kind of, yeah, before you can kind of make, yeah, abroad, yeah, exactly. Before you can kind of make a difference in the world. And, and, uh, and, 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 and surely it's seven, uh, the man who, who, you know, who's started this organization and runs it to this day, has, uh, has really kind of taken that to heart. And it's it's great to have um, men and women like you and your wife uh, supporting him in this. And uh, you you weren't sure the number, but according to the website, it's 105. It's 105 families right now that he's providing that that stability that you're talking about. And um, that sense of normalcy has to work wonders on those children that, you know, are classmates of your daughter, you know, and it's 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 great it's it's great that they can uh, they can impart that at uh, seven bridges to recovery so so uh so everyone i, I as I, as always and every week uh, i i pledge um i pledge a i pledge a very small and meager donation to every organization wait, wait, that's wait, brought wait. up on uh -oh. Are you there? yes i'm here um so i, I was saying that um i uh, every week sean I, I i pledge a very you know um a very small donation to every organization that's brought up on my show. And so I, I've, I'm going to be donating uh, later tonight uh, in your honor. Um, a very, mm -hmm. again, very small amount, but, uh, but, you know, it helps none, you know, every little bit helps. And so I encourage everyone, if, if you're moved by Sean's story uh, about seven story with seven bridges to recovery, I, I've put the link in the, sh in the, uh, in the comment section, the link will be in the show notes later. Uh, please, I, we both encourage you to, to consider giving because this is a this is a great cause and and while Atlanta may not be home for you, um, it's home to Sean and uh, it's it's home to this, uh, these these this very small number. It's it's a large number, 105 families. But uh, it, again, it all starts somewhere. And if if you want to if you choose to help, and we would uh, I, I know uh, Sean, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I know we I would be very grateful if you did. So oh, I absolutely would. I absolutely would. Absolutely. Wonderful. What a, what a tremendous cause. Really excited. Uh, really excited about this. So, you know, you, you know, you, you, you I mentioned, say, man. yes, sir. I, I, I'm just really, uh, yeah. I mean, listen, as, as we talk about the price of a cigar and, and, and I'm on my second cigar, you know, and um, me too, <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, the fact that you even do this, um, you know, even bring this up or, 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 or put a spotlight on, Whatever other charities, uh, your other cigar guys sort of bring up is just uh, it's commendable, and, and and I thank you for doing that. That's this is this is it's made the night worth it, man. Of all the stuff we did, this is this is this is different. It's special. I think. Well, Sean, thank you for those humbling words. I really appreciate it. It's, 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 it's rooted in, it's rooted in the cigar industry. You know, I, 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 you know, thought about, you know, many ways that I could help, but there's so many, so many good, good, great people like yourself who've done more outside this industry uh, in terms of work with charity and philanthropy. And, and, uh, and I, I wanted to be a part of it. And I thought like, you know, again, what, what, what could I do? And, and it's that, you know, it's that age old mantra of, you know, a journey of a thousand steps, you know, a thousand miles starts with the first step. And, and I thought this would be a really great way to, you know, you know, bring what brings what matters to my guests, to my audience. And, and, and so thank you for sharing tonight. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Um, so kind of going into your back back much back deeper in, into your your story we, we talked about new orleans um and, and you mentioned uh being um being the son of a, of a single mother and uh and uh you you mentioned earlier about your your first foray into nicaragua and then just a few moments ago with the the families that you help you and your wife and your family help out at seven bridges to recovery and, and i can't help but think that you know it, you know the the humility that 
that you have in your in your own story in your own journey because you know uh, you you and I both didn't come from money um, and uh, and you you certainly had your own trials and tribulations growing up you know your mother uh, from from my all of my accounts and the the in previous interviews that you've given has been a, is a personal hero of yours what she was able to do uh, with her life and and raising uh, you and your brothers um, who I understand um, all have college degrees right yeah man yeah she did that she where'd did that you, all on her own you get, how'd you how'd you how'd you where'd you get that from um, I, I, I've heard it in a couple of I've heard it in a couple of interviews. I know you you pay a lot of tribute. You know, we talked about Eddie Robinson earlier, but I know you have a great deal of respect for your mom. And I mean, obviously, so I mean, she, I mean, she raised an an incredible man uh, from from what I see, and I can imagine your brothers are are very similar to you. So, no, we're so different, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we could we could be. It's a it's an amazing thing, man. If if you met us separately, you wouldn't think we grew up in the same house. It's, uh, it's no, what. <laughs> With that being said, my brothers are, 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 are the, the closest brother to me is eight years older than one, 10 years old and 12. So they grew up, you know, kind of stair steps two years apart. And then uh, so she had those three and then eight years later had me. So they were up and out of the house by the time I, I got into hell, middle school even. Um, but, yeah, we, we're, we're all uh, uh, very different personality wise, uh, 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 different interests and whatever. Um, but I mean, there, there's certain some 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 commonalities, right? Um, but but yeah, yeah, we're we're it's a it's 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 a weird dynamic, man. <laughs> weird dynamic. So th that being said, what you know, what was it like? Um, you know, what was it like growing up in New Orleans? And you know, actually, you know what? I, I'm just gonna cut straight to the chase on this. Okay, you know, growing up, you know, growing up in New Orleans, I. And if I'm playing the assumptive game, I apologize. I assume that young Sean Williams did not dream of becoming a cigar maker. Um, no. What what was what was the dream of young Sean Williams growing up in New Orleans? Um, well, I mean, I, I played you know sports, played football from the time you know I was uh, eight or something. So you know, of course, every little kid that plays sports dreams of playing professional sports. That's uh, that was always there, but professionally, the first thing I thought I would ever be would be uh, an architect. Um, and it sort of came from a weird sort of place. Um, there's a there's a McDonald's that's on uh, it's on St. Charles Avenue near Louisiana Avenue, uh, uh, uptown New Orleans. And I remember as a kid, uh, must have been 10 or 11 or so when, when that when that McDonald's was, was, was built and we'd go there and it looked different from any McDonald's I'd ever seen. Um, you know, kind of McDonald's had sort of the typical, you know, sort of red roof back then, at least in the, in the 70s and 80s. And this one was really different. And I, I assume it was different because it was on St. Charles Avenue and, and whatever. Uh, but it, it was actually designed by uh, by this uh, this black architect by the name of Paul Devereaux. And, um, you know, the only architect I'd ever heard about was, uh, um, um, who was the guy on the Brady Bunch? Uh, who was the, the dad on the Brady Bunch? Um, oh you gosh! I remember the Brady Bunch, but yeah, no, I remember the I. I remember the boys' names. I remember yeah, yeah. Peter, uh, Greg, Bobby, and and Peter Bobby. Greg, but um, oh god, what was the father's name? Yeah, it wasn't Tom Brady, but but yeah, whatever, Mr. Right? Mr. Like, Brady, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so I, I I just that was that was my idea of an architect. And then when I saw this, when I was home, oh, yeah, this guy is like uh, Paul Devereaux, and I was like, wow, like really, like like very very New Orleans name, Paul Devereaux. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh. I was like, instantly, I was like, I want to be an architect. I want to design a McDonald's. Like that was kind of the thing. And I always I would always draw as a kid, um, and I never drew structures, but it was just you know, people and and you know whatever scenes and stuff. And and then when I got into high school, I, I actually took drafting courses and and stuff. So that was kind of like the initial um thing that i was interested in in, in doing um and i just kind of changed for a, a couple of reasons um i uh I, I got accepted into this this uh this um kind of like uh um i guess youth development and internship organization called inroads uh but it was specifically for business and engineering majors uh so obviously there's no architecture path in there and and, and i got placed with an internship with uh with south central bell uh, and also, I signed a scholarship to go to Grambling, which didn't have an architecture school. Though I could have taken drafting and taken course at Louisiana Tech, but um, as I got 
into into high school, I started uh, more high school. I started thinking more about business and marketing and stuff like that. So that mm -hmm. kind of changed. But the first thing I remember as a kid wanting to do professionally was be an architect. So so yeah. So no cigars were. You know, like, <laughs> so is that why you got into the 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 mortgage business, the the business background, and the architectural dreams? Uh no, that was my brother, man. So I was in a uh, in a. Uh, I, I worked for the, this is like, this is, this is, this is a different interview. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with this. This, this is cool. Um, so yeah, so I, I worked for, uh, for uh, South Central Bell, which, which all became Bell South um, and uh, interned uh, with the phone company throughout college. And I graduated, went on full time with the phone company. And, and I was, uh, I was a manager in the residence collection center. You're talking about a pressure cooker of a job, dude. I had like, <laughs> a, I had like 22, 24 uh, uh, service reps that that worked under me, and 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 we were in the office that if somebody's phone got cut off, that's the office they called to. To oh goodness, so it was you know it was always just whatever. So from that, I uh, 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 um, uh, I moved over from residence collections into business collections, which was great to get out of residence into business, even though it's still collections, so it's still like 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 a shit show, but it was business, so it was a little bit different. Uh, and then from that, I actually got promoted to uh, to be a small business sales manager, which that move actually moved me from South Central Bell to Southern Bell. So I moved to Atlanta back in late 93, early 94. Um, you know, so um, I've been with the phone company since I was, when I graduated June 4th, 1988. Now, very next Monday, I was at work uh, in the phone company as, as, as a college intern. So I've been there all through college. I worked there for a few years professionally after coming out and uh, I really just wanted to do something different. Like, um, you know, uh, you know, I first started there, I was like, oh, I mean, work the phone company, man, you worked there forever. You never got to get, you know, worry about another job. Um, and that was the old phone company. Uh, but when I was there, it was different. It was, you know, you're going through deregulation. So, um, you know, you got um, uh, the, 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 the local uh, phone service splitting from long distance. You had the rise of uh, uh, PCS at the time, personal communications, where, you know, cell phones were coming up. And it was just a lot going on that, that the industry was just going through this major, major overhaul. And phone company, like like every other private uh, 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 major company at the time, was going through reorganizations and whatever, and people getting uh, downsized out and whatever. And I was like, you know what? I, I just, I just, you know, I, I just wanted to do something different. Didn't want to wait around to, to you know, 20 years later, get a gold watch and, 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 and you know, whatever. So I ended up moving back to New Orleans with the, with the thoughts of going to work for um, a marketing company at the time called the Catherine Group. I'll never forget that. Um, and, um, I, uh, you know, had some connections and, and, and was able to get an opportunity there. But I packed up my stuff, moved back to New Orleans. Um, and uh, they were bringing me on, uh, I, I assume with a few other people as well, because um, uh, their big contract at the time was with the New Orleans International Airport. Uh, but that was the same time that uh, Harris had just got the contract to open a casino, and that was like, their big, big client. Um, uh, so I, I'll get back to New Orleans, and then I don't remember what happened, but uh, something from a regulatory standpoint uh, didn't allow the casino to open. So, uh, so I didn't have a job. So I did a couple of eyeball things. Um, um, but ended up landing on my feet in the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, which was, uh, you know, so most of my professional career was actually working in pharmaceutical, Bristol Myers oh. Square, Aventus Pharmaceuticals, um, and eventually went to work for a dental devices company. Uh, and and it was my time at the at the dental devices company that that was uh, probably um, I was probably at the height of my 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 career in in the, the, the pharmaceutical and medical devices space, but it was the worst professional experience of my life. Um, <laughs> I, I, just, I just, I hated everything about it. Um, uh, um, and, and I've never, like, I'm, I'm, I can usually, you know, I can usually, you know, get along and, 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 and you know, be mission driven or whatever, but uh, I, I just, I just, I didn't like the people I worked for, didn't get with the girl. It's just, it's just a bad experience. So uh, I was unhappy in my brother, um, the one who's eight years above me, uh, retired Marine. Uh, he uh, he was in oh. the real estate game, so to speak. Had a number of um, rental properties in, in Memphis, and uh, he would you know do his financing with different. This was you know in the early two thousands at like like the height of the mortgage game, and he would do his 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 his, his, his write his paper uh, so to speak with a number of different. Uh, mortgage companies and brokers, and and uh, and he didn't necessarily have a proclivity proclivity for that. 
uh, but he thought I would. He's like, dude, like you, 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 you know, you, you want to get out of, uh, you know, what you're doing. I think you'd be great in, in the mortgage game, man. Why don't you get in the mortgage business? And I'll, I'll give you, you know, I'll write business with you. So um, that's how I started researching it and um, ended up getting into the mortgage business, went, went through uh, training here in Atlanta and became a certified mortgage specialist and opened up my, uh, my own uh, mortgage outfit. And, and, um, you know, and that's about the time actually not long after that, where, uh, that would have been 2003, um, maybe even 2004, 2003, 2004, something like that. And it wasn't long after that, obviously 2005 was when I smoked my first cigar. And then that just, you know, you know, 2008, uh, everybody got wiped out, uh, at least that I knew for the most part in, in the real estate game. And, and, uh, and, you know, for me as, 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 you know, as, as, you know, circumstances would have it, um, I, I had, you know, launched my cigar brand a couple of years before that and actually had my cigars on the shelves with, uh, you know, a number of shops, mostly in New Orleans, but a few outside of, uh, I'm sorry, mostly in Atlanta and a few outside of Atlanta as well. Um, you know, and actually, uh, I think by that time I had gotten a, a, you know, a couple of good ratings. So I, I thought I might have something, uh, you know, uh, had nothing, certainly had nothing to lose. I lost it all in real estate. So, uh, so I went full time in, uh, in cigar business in 2008, 2009. So, yeah. That's, 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 that's the, that's the, that's the, the, the thumbnails, right? The, the, the <laughs> of, 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 that, of that time. So, yeah. So from, man, you really just have the song of the South, just like protruding through your veins, man. Connections in Memphis, New Orleans, Atlanta. I mean, you've, <laughs> you've got all the, the, the bright spots of the, of the, the South, man. Just. It is, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a Southern boy, man. Uh, I, and I say it proudly. <laughs> So, correct me if I'm wrong here, Sean. Your 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 mom was also an entrepreneur too. She had a she had a small business, correct? Yeah, 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 man. And um, yeah, she had she she owned a couple of uh uh, uh bars, man. Um, you know, the Gemini and the Scene. I'll never forget that. Um, the Scene was first, and the Gemini was second. But yeah, I was. I guess from the time I was like in preschool into my earlier years in, in, in elementary school. I, I yeah, I, I, I remember just, uh, sitting at the bar, which I guess you could do that now, but uh, <laughs> I'd be there like when she's prepping a bar for the evenings or whatever, and she would, she would give me a little drink. She would give me a little, uh, uh, uh little cream de banana, the liqueur with a little milk. And I sit there and sit there. <laughs> she's prepping a bar until someone came to pick me up and take me home after school and stuff. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, that, that's 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 how how I grew up, man. Um, you know, she had a couple of businesses, lost a couple of businesses, went to work and did whatever she needed to do, and went back to college. Um, uh, she was she was finishing up college when I was midway through college, you know. So, it's, it's, you know, so she just yeah, she did she 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 did her thing, man. You know what can I say? Yeah, that's awesome. Where'd she where'd she end up graduating from college? Uh, Southern University of New Orleans. Awesome. So when, when you uh, kind of got into the foray of your own business, you know, la- you know, launching El Premier Mundo and everything, I guess that, that uh, I bet that I- I'm just, I'm sure mothers are always proud of their sons, especially the, especially the young, I'm, I'm a youngest son too. Okay. Um, but, um, but uh, mothers are always proud of us, but I, I feel that, uh, I mean, considering you, you got, you, you started your own business too. That had to, that had to be very special for her. Yeah. I mean, I was, that wasn't my first business. Though. I mean, I owned a restaurant in New Orleans, my wife and I, um, uh, Juju's Kitchen. It was uh, uh, down in uh, Central City, right near the courthouses. And, and uh, so I had a restaurant. Uh, this is when I was in pharmaceuticals. We, we owned a restaurant and had rental property. So that was, I guess that was probably the first sort of really structured business that, that, that I had. I mean, I've done little, you know, consulting things. I've at least tried to at least, but had a restaurant. Uh, then, of course, I had the mortgage business. And from that, I actually uh, built uh, spec homes. Uh, I would build, you know, four or five homes a year, um, you know, at the height of the, the real estate game. So so the cigars were, were, you know, by that time, it was kind of, you know, the die had been cast. I mean, you know, um, you know, once, 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 once you, 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 if you have the stomach for it, right. Um, you know, once you get into entrepreneurship, it's, it's, kind of hard to, to to go to work with somebody and that was sort of the, the big thing uh um you know that i had to consider um you know deciding whether or not i want to do do this with uh general and cohiba just you know the big thing was like man i'm going to go to work for somebody and not only somebody but the largest cigar company in the game like 
I'm thinking they're going to shove a GPS up my ass and load me down with you know, <laughs> kinds of paperwork and whatever. Um, so it's it's it, it's been it's been it, but it's it's it, it's it's been a, a great experience. Like it's just it's it's uh, that was one of the big things I thought I hadn't worked for anybody, man, in forever. Like hook a crook, you know. I mean, as an entrepreneur, I mean, there's a lot of times where you pay a lot of people before you pay yourself, and I had a lot of you know weeks and months like that. Um, you know, you have up and down years and do whatever. Um, but something about the freedom that that um, that you kind of get used to, the freedom to 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 succeed or fail. Um, you know, it's all on you. Um, sometimes you know you hit a home run. You know, sometimes you never get up to to to, to the plate. But you know, it's on you. Uh, so that was probably as big a you know a consideration as anything. Like just the thought of going to work for somebody. You know. I imagine so. You, you so recently, actually, very recently, that just this week, uh, tobacco business uh, releases its use its newest issue, and uh, yours truly sitting across from me is is the is the cover boy, uh, feature done on on you, and uh, you know I, I I happened to read the uh, the article. Um, Antoine Reed did a fantastic job with it. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, it was it was. Much like this interview, it's like it's, it's 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 a whole lot more involved than just you know me talking about cigar plants, which which is kind of cool. Yeah. That's what I really like about Antoine, because Antoine, like himself, I I'm actually eager to actually have a sit down with him at some point. You know, Antoine's uh, experience with cigars is, is is relatively recent. You know, you know, pers- you know, f- perspectively speaking, you know, like compared to compared to the two of us, for example, mm-hmm. he's very recent to this industry, and but. So I I have a feeling his his penchant for finding the story behind the story is is much like my own you know it's just just natural curiosity but uh, but one of the things right off the bat in his article and that you kind of point out that it's like your three you mentioned three keys to success and one of them was find a mentor and we've talked a lot about mentors today we talked about Eddie Robinson of course um, I've I've mentioned my father quite a bit he's one of my mentors um, and I imagine that your your mom obviously is is also one of the, one of those people for you um yeah, and I, don't, I don't know that she that she went into it thinking i'm going to be a mentor she's just a mom just trying to you know um you know raise us in the right way and do the best she can but just just you know I, i'm sure when she's you know standing behind the bar you know getting ready she wasn't thinking that you know this is going to be something that you know my son is going to see and it's going to internalize and know you know that he shouldn't be afraid to take risks i don't, I don't think she put that much thought into it um but, but she did. I mean, and, 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 uh, just, you know, I'm a big guy. Um, none of my brothers are little, you know, <laughs> she, she clothed and fed us and, and, uh, 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 we had a lot of ups and downs growing up, you know, uh, but, 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 you know, she just like, you know, just, she just figured away, man. So, um, so, you know, without her even trying, it was just, just sort of one of those things that, that I just saw, saw sort of a, a spirit of like uh, survival, so to speak, you know, um, and, and risk taking, you know, not, not a lot of those risks uh, uh, always paid off, but, but, you know, um, it just, it just, you know, it, it, it kind of made me not afraid of things, you know, you know, cause I knew, all right, well, I've been through it. We'll make it right. You know, if this doesn't work. So, um, and I, I just, I just got there from, got there from just growing up with her, man. You know, uh, now with, the, with that being said, I mean, you know, uh, certainly, you know, people in my life, I mean, you know, um, you know, uh, it's not easy for uh, somebody to be uh, uh, married to an entrepreneur, right? You know, it, it's a roller coaster ride that not a lot of people, um, you know, really know that they're signing up for. So, uh, so, you know, I, I, I admire my wife just as much as, 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 as I, I admire my mother, you know, um, for the role she played in my life, you know what I'm saying? So, it all, you know, you know, nobody gets here on their own, man. Nobody. I don't care what they say. Nobody gets here on their own, you know. And and I, I never, ever, ever forget that. Ever forget that. Yeah. Kind of goes back to that. Un- un- unconsequently, honestly, I didn't know where this this conversation was necessarily headed with this, but that kind of goes back to that question I asked you, right? Or if you were afraid of failure, it sounds like, it sounds like you're, um, even though you're you respect failure and. You, you're afraid of it, but it doesn't paralyze you. Comes from that strength comes obviously from from your mom who experienced those ups and downs as well. Yeah, yeah. And as a kid, you experience them with her. So, and and as a kid, you don't know. You don't know. You know. Um, a lot of times, you don't know when you're poor. 
right? And and conversely, you don't know yeah. when you're well off. It's just kind of like it is what it is. And and kids, you know, are able to 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 find joy in 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 sometimes the simplest the, the simplest of an existence, right? Like kids don't need a whole lot, right? You mm-hmm. know, you, we think they do, but it's just amazing, man. You you know, uh, and I've seen it from traveling all over the world. You see kids, and you, and, and, and I'm. You know, I'm thinking like, wow, man, and he's like, 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 you know, look how these people have to live. And the kids just run around having fun. They, if they don't know any better, you know, like, um, you know, and, and I was, you know, just sort of like coming up, you just kind of roll with the punches and, uh, and, 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 and find enjoyment in, you know, wherever you are, as much as you can as a kid, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if you, you just keep that mentality and, and, and just realize, you know, okay, well, you know, there's been times where, you know, we had, you know, growing up at a nice townhouse out in New Orleans East. And there were times where we lived in public housing in uptown New Orleans. So, you know, but either way, you find friends in the neighborhood, right? You 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 have you know what I'm saying? You just you just you just you just adjust, man. So um, you know, I'm I'm never too comfortable and 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 um and I'm never really, really afraid of of material things, at least. Not in the least. So, and I mentioned at the very top of our conversation, Sean, how you, over the years, you've built incredible relationships uh, with, within this industry. I mean, there's so many people, and like I mentioned, several people that I had conversations with prior to tonight's interview that just have so much respect for you, what you've built, what you are, what you've done. Um, you know, so, I mean, there's got to be several, I'm assuming, um, cause you, you, you made that very clear in your interview that you, to find that mentor, that's, that's a key to success. So who, who, who is the, uh, who's the mentor for Sean Williams in the cigar industry right now? Um, there's people I look, so it, it, internally, um, you know, and, and, and thanks to, thanks to, to COVID, I haven't had a chance to be with him personally, uh, or, 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 or see him personally and talk to him, but, uh, certainly, uh, our president Regis, um, you know, young guy, uh, super dynamic, um, really easy to talk to, approachable, fun loving. I mean, he, he, you know, he'll, 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 he'll roll with the best of them and, and party and have fun. Um, but, you know, when the meeting starts the next morning, he's there ready to go and he's not taking any shit, you know, and, and, uh, and he has a, just this great balance of, of, of again, having fun, you know, uh, being innovative giving you a lot of latitude, taking risk and whatever. Um, but you gotta be accountable, you know, you know, play hard, you know, uh, which I don't play hard anymore, <laughs> but, but play hard, but work hard. Right. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and show up. Uh, so I really, really, uh, appreciate that approach. Um, Chris Tarr is, is, is another, uh, which a lot of people you would know this guy, but, um, he's, a, a, a you know, a VP of marketing. Um, and he, he has a sort of a, uh, uh, a very sort of uh, uh, assertive approach to to uh, the way he, he 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 takes on things from a branding perspective, willing to take risks, try new things. Um, you know, really, really uh, uh, encouraging. Has a great insight uh, outside of just the cigar space, which is which is really important to me. And then there's you know guys that 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 I talk to on a regular basis. Um, uh, who are more contemporaries, but, you know, iron sharpens iron, right? So we always just kind of, you know, kind of, you know, uh, just bounce stuff off of each other and, 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 and you know, kind of keep each other in check, so to speak. And, you know, I, you know, Rick, I mean, you know, Rick Rodriguez, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Ernie, you know, um, you know, Jonathan Drew was, was certainly somebody early on that, um, that I talked to a, a lot. We haven't, had a chance to really talk directly of, of, uh, recently in a while, um, you know, but you know, somebody I really leaned on a lot early on uh, as I was kind of just making different decisions. So, yeah, man, I mean, you know, mentors don't necessarily have to be like, uh, you know, uh, someone necessarily in your field or in your space, uh, or it doesn't have to necessarily be somebody that's maybe ahead of you professionally. Um, but it should, somebody, it should be somebody that's gonna speak to you honestly, right? And uh, and give you um, you know honest dialogue, but 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 also um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
someone who's really vested in your success, right? Like, like, mm-hmm. like, 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 who really, really cares about you uh, being successful and doing the right thing, and 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 is willing to tell you, willing to tell you when you're not doing the right thing, right? So there's a number of people, I, uh, you know, I, I, I talk to now, and, and and people play different roles, different compartments, and there's, there's friends of mine um, that, you know. Um, most people in the cigar industry would never, would never know, or never see uh, who I've been friends with for 10, 15 years. And in the case of one of my friends, we've been friends, you know, better than half my life. Um, you know, he's like a brother to me. And, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what magazine cover I'm on or, 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 you know, what uh, cigar rating I got, whatever. I mean, he's the one that will tell you your shit stinks, you know what I'm saying? So, you, need to <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, so as if people play different roles in your life, man. You know, uh, but the big thing is, you know, you need people who are going to be honest with you um, and who really care about you. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and um, and, um, you know, and, 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 you know, who can hopefully offer a different perspective from time to time. So. You, you mentioned Jonathan Drew, and, and I know that he imparted some words of wisdom to you when uh, um, when it mattered most. And, and they were very simple words. Um, be patient and don't panic. Um, so at the time when you received that message, like what, what did that, what did that mean to you? And how have you taken those words and, and, and carried it with you, uh, for the well, time? That, that was really impactful because, um, I had a, um, I was, I was in talks with another company about doing, um, a distribution arrangement and, uh, and this sort of quasi partnership, right. That I was considering. And, um, and it was something I, I thought that if I'm going to do this, I needed a certain sort of setup financially, support wise, whatever, whatever. Um, but there were other reasons to do this deal aside from just finances, maybe there's some long term benefit. But I wasn't sure which which one was more important to me at the time. And uh, and I remember John was in he was in Japan at the time. So um, so obviously he was you know, 10 or 12 hours off of my clock. Um, and, and, and we're, we're going back with over a few days, actually texting back and forth. And, um, and it's not like he could say, you should do this or don't do this. It's like, okay, you thought about this, thought about this, thought about this. And, 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 and ultimately I was like, you know, I still don't know, like, like, uh, I don't, I don't think the, the, the deal makes sense for me now, but I don't want to regret it, regret it later. And I was kind of ready to do something. He's like, listen, he says, the world's not going to stop. Right. It's not like, you know. Um, you make a bad decision, the world's going to insist. The big thing is, you know, uh, be patient and, and, and don't panic. Don't make a desperate decision. And I actually pumped the brakes on that. And, and you know, a year after, I mean, I was just gleeful that, man, I'm glad I didn't do that. Right. So, um, so that really, really at the time, it was, it, it, it would have been a consequential decision. I mean, who knows? Like, you know, I, I most probably wouldn't be here. Um, because it was just taking things in a, in a different direction. So I, I stayed, I kept my independence and I ended up doing a, a distribution deal with PDR later on, but that made sense for a lot of different reasons. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, and John and I, we, 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 we talked, we talked a lot. Uh, over the, I mean, I, I first met him, uh, this was 2007 uh, in a Wella Wella restaurant in uh, Los Arcos Hotel in Estevina, Nicaragua. And he had actually been a, uh, he, uh, Drew Estates had been a, a supporter of mine early on. Uh, really, I don't know if he, if he even knew it. It was when I had the Atlanta Cigar Society and I would do different events and I would uh, uh, reach out to different cigar companies for sponsorship and support. And Drew Estates was, if not the first, certainly one of the first cigar companies to really support my events like like in, in, in pretty uh, uh, significant fashion as far as product. And, 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 oh, that's uh, awesome accessories and stuff like that. And Dave Sather at the time was the manager. He was like the sales manager I used to deal with. And, and uh, so when I saw Jonathan, I'm in a restaurant. This is probably my second trip, third trip maybe to Nicaragua. And I'm in a restaurant having uh, having uh, lunch with uh, my rep at the time, uh, Frank Lopez. And uh, and Jonathan walked in. Frank had worked for Drew Estate. So initially, you know, they saw each other. They started talking and, and Frank introduced me and we started talking and I kind of told him about how his company had supported me and he didn't really know much about it. He kind of vaguely, he may or may not have known about it. He kind of, oh, I kind of heard about that. I don't think he did, but it didn't matter. <laughs> so we started talking and, and, and we were buddies like ever since. And, and um, you know, and it was two, 2010, uh, I launched League of Miami uh, 
and we're at the New Orleans show. Uh, so tight the bronze. I did the cigar with them. Their their booth was one aisle over from mine, and and uh, Willie comes over to my booth, and we just kind of talking. You know, legal mind was just killing it at the show. Uh, so we walk out to get some food, and we come back in, and we're passing the Drew Estates booth, and uh, you know, Drew Estates booth always had the music and all kind of stuff going on. Yeah. I was like, oh, I need to go and talk to John. He's like, uh, John, I say John at the Drew. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, you never met John? He's like, no. I was like, oh, man, you need to meet a cool guy. So I brought Willie over, introduced Willie to Jonathan. We started talking. Uh, Jonathan ended up coming to my booth. We started talking, and, and it just so happens I was going to be in Miami that next week to work on some, you know, the production to fulfill the orders for Illegal Miami. So while I was there, hit up Jonathan. We all got together at Sergio's over in uh, Coral Gables, uh, had some lunch uh, uh, with Gary Arts at the time. Rest his soul. Man, I forgot about Gary Arts. So it was me, Willie, Jonathan, and Gary Arts. And uh, Jonathan lit up Illegal Miami and just it blew his mind. He's like, oh, this is great. This is exceptional. And um, that's when he got interested in Titan of Bronze. And literally, we finished lunch from there, went to Titan of Bronze, and 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 was there like into into into, into the wee hours of, of of the night. And that's what started the process of 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 uh, Jonathan. Initially, he's like, oh, he he wanted to buy Titan of Bronze, right? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously that didn't happen. But a year later, what did happen is Willie Herrera went on board with uh, Drew Estates as oh wow, the blender, yeah. There you go. So small, small world. Crazy, like, it's a small world. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we were all, we were all, you know, me, Willie, Jonathan, Ernie Padilla. Um, we're sitting in there. This is another trip. We we're in there, uh, Willie and I. I don't remember what, maybe it's Epifanio we're working on. I don't even know. But Ernie Padilla calls, and I had met Ernie uh, previously in New Orleans, uh, I keep saying New Orleans, in Atlanta when he was here um, working with Rich Myberg, uh, uh, who was my rep and his rep at the time. Um, uh, Ernie calls. He wants to come over because he wants to uh, re-release the Miami 8 and 11, which he had previously made with Pepin, which, which is, you know, they're on Calle Ocho, uh, um, a half block away from Titan the Bronze, but Titan the Bronze literally sits at uh, 8 and 11, which is Calle Ocho in uh, uh, 11th Street. So he wants to re-blend the cigar um, or relaunch it, and uh, he only has one cigar left that 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 Willie is to remake this blend from. So so Ernie comes in. And, uh, and it's like the worst way to do this, but he has a Solomon. It's not like, if you're gonna blend a cigar, you blend a cigar in a Toro. So the right. cigar that 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 that, that uh, he's bringing over to sort of deconstruct and, uh, cause you know, you can say what tobacco is in it, but you still gotta taste it to, to, to cause it, you know, it sure. may not be the same. So literally he comes in with the Solomon. He's like, okay, well, we gotta smoke this. And we say we, all three of us literally pass this Solomon, this, this, this eight and 11 Solomon around like a joint. Uh, uh, so that Willie can pick up the nuances, and he picked up the nuances, and 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 and, and they started working on a relaunch of the, the eight and eleven. So it's just crazy, man. How how um, you know um, the small guys like like we were so interconnected. Like and, and obviously every you know Willie's going on to to, to, to Drew Estates and uh, Ernie selling millions of cigars a year, and I'm here talking to you. Um, but you know th those days I I I I, I kind of miss. I must admit, you know um, those 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 are those are the, the, the things that kind of make you, man. You know, those are the oh. things that make you. So, you know. Small world, small yeah. world. Yeah. I don't even remember the first question you asked me, man. <laughs> no, it was great. No, um, you know, um, I, I, you know, Sean, I, I, I have three, three final questions tonight. And uh, it's usually about this time that I always sit across from my guests and I always thank them for the time that they gave me. I, you know, even with COVID, um, you know, Sunday is, I, I always lament that this is, this is a family day. And so I recognize what a sacrifice it is for my guests to always sit across from me and, 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 and have a conversation with me uh, into the, the wee hours of the morning uh, in case of East coast time where you, where you're at. And uh and uh, your story is, is is just is just froth with nuance and just amazing amazing story. I was just so pleased to sit down with you tonight, and I really really just I can't thank you enough. Uh, and and please pass my 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 gratitude on to your to your family, to your wife, for the sacrifice that you made tonight just to have a conversation with me and share with my audience just a little bit about who you are and 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 how how you've become uh, the you that you are. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. So, um, so final three questions is the, the two, the last two, and then the last one's kind of fun. So the, this one, I call these like the obligatories, right? So you, you mentioned, we've mentioned COVID a couple of times done. How can you not, you know, with what's going on, but you know, some, some good news has come out this new year in 2021, um, with, um, 
you know, uh, it's certainly not the end. COVID's still here, but it's the I would what I what I positively reflect on the beginning of the end with the release of the vaccine and and yeah. uh, and everything. Yeah. So you know, yeah. with the the vaccine out now and and uh, you know it it getting distributed uh, in due course, you know, you know as as hopefully we all hope uh, COVID COVID nineteen ends uh, sh- surely, but. Uh, surely but uh but can't come soon enough what are, what are you looking forward to most um once uh once you're able to kind of get back to a sense of normalcy yeah. uh two things i i i i, I don't know what 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 i'm jonesing for more uh to get back to the factory uh or 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 to 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 to, to get back into the shops doing regular events man so um you know, I mean, from a professional standpoint, those are the things. And, and also I'm looking forward to, to not worrying about the health of, uh, you know, my mother who's 80 and, and, and my family, obviously. Um, but, you know, if COVID hasn't done anything, it, 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 it afforded uh, myself, as, as I imagine with many people, uh, a lot of opportunity to spend with your families. So, mm-hmm. um, so that if anything was a bright spot, that's it. But uh, from, from a business standpoint, man, I, I'm, I, do that. I, since I've been in this business, I've never um, spent, I went to the factory in February of last year, February of last year. And, and now this is almost a year that I've been to the factory. That's, that's unheard of. So I am, I am, I can't wait to just get back into the factory and just smell the tobacco and, you know, work on the new stuff and touch the new stuff, just be down there, man. Uh, so, so definitely that. And, and, and then on the other end of, of, of that process, being in stores, doing events, man, um, you know, out there, you know, enjoying, you know, my creation with, 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 you know, the, 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 the people who are, who are ultimately going to, going to consume it and, and getting that instant feedback and just, you know, just fellowshipping with people, man. So I'm, I'm, I can't wait. Yeah. You know, we're all, we're all on pins and needles for you, Sean. And for us to just to kind of get back to that kind of thing. Cause we just, or I think we're all kind of jonesing for that for that sense of normalcy to do an event again, to be at an event again, to enjoy cigars with uh, with great company and and everything. So, um, so this next question, I, I know I know the decision was was above you, so I know it wasn't your decision personally, but you know uh, the, before COVID nineteen hits, General Cigar uh, among three other companies announces that they're not going to be at last year's trade show. Mm-hmm. Of course, the trade show doesn't happen. Uh, and even with the positive news of the vaccine and everything, the idea of uh, a PCA trade show, let alone the TPE trade show, which has been moved for, for now, it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that, that w- they will occur either. But mm-hmm. um, do you see a avenue uh, in which General Cigar may make an appearance at both trade shows this year if they do actually happen or... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we'll have a presence at TPE, um, just based on uh, last year and 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 the the commitments that um, were expressed going into this year before COVID, obviously. Um, um, yeah, and, and I, I may be speaking out of school. That 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 that's more of an executive thing, but I I, I don't see us at PCA. Um, you know, and yeah, uh, it, especially. Being that the planning would have to have to revolve around uh, executing over the summer, which I can't imagine that we if we were going to do something like that, we'd be working on it feverishly right now, and and and, and, and we're not. So um, I, I I I don't have any expectation that that, that we would be at PCA. Now, would that be the case, you know, next year or whatever? I, I don't know, but this year I'm I'm fairly confident that we we won't be participating in PCA um, at any point during this year, but. Again, that, that that's above me, but I think I think I would have because we'd be working on that stuff right now. So, you know, the the general booth was is 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 the one of the best experiences that I've had at the trade show, and the trade show is certainly full of a lot of them. So I I hope that the future, 2022, 2023, whenever that whatever the case may be, I hope that. I hope that uh, that general does that general does come back like the other companies as well, and and uh, you know this 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 industry can unite once again in in. In multiple fashions, TPE, no, PCA, no, that'd no be great. Argument, everybody. No, no. I mean, the, the show to me was, uh, if for nothing else, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, the biggest and best of reunions for us. You know, so to, to see everybody and and and, um, and sort of reconnect with your friends in, in, in the industry. You know, so um, I, I can't tell you how much I, I missed that component of it. 
but you know, but there's a business component to that that has to be sorted out. So. Well, Sean, this is my last question. And it's actually a two part question. It's my curveball segment. I always kind of have a little bit of fun with it. And I kind of I typically try to connect a theme that we've been talking about in the night right. the night before. And so tonight we've talked a lot about mentors, you know, uh, Eddie Robinson, your mother, uh, all the people in the industry that uh, that have kind of helped you along the way and people outside the industry, like uh, your lifelong friend that you were talking about. So uh, this is a two part question. Um, for the first one's easy. Uh, do you consider yourself a mentor for anybody and who? And the second one is you don't have to, you don't have to attribute them because it's a challenging question, but you've had some many successful mentors along the way. Has there been a time that one of your mentors has got something wrong? So do you consider yourself a mentor for anyone? And when was an, when was a so, time? So, so, so I'll, I'll, I will answer that question this way. There are other people that consider me a mentor to them, and I'm happy to be considered that way, and happy to 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 uh, hopefully um, impart any influence or, or or advice I can that that help helps them uh, uh, grow uh, professionally, personally, or or, or, or or any other way. Um, um, now, who those people are. Um, um, and and I, I will say this based on what they've said. Right? Of course, of course, uh, of course. I'm, I'm not full of myself enough to think that, hey, this is this is this is my mentee. I'm, uh, that's you know, um, but uh, uh, certainly um, you know, a few people have expressed to me, and a few people have expressed to other people. Um, uh, Eric Bay with uh, uh, Black Star Lines, um, um, he's expressed that that um, you know that he considers me a mentor. Um, uh, Chris with Carolina Blue. Um, I'm trying to think, who else? Um, I mean, that that's as of as of recent as far as people that that have said that. Um, now, with that being said, there's certainly a number of people that reach out to me on a on, you know you know pretty regularly. Somebody's reaching out to me, asking advice or or, or you know asking my thoughts on things. And uh, but for those people you know, whether they consider me a mentor, but, you know, um, I would think Ernie, we, 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 we talk all the time, we, you know, uh, 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 but, but I think that that's a two way uh, chip, um, you know, and, and the same with other people I, I consider contemporaries that, that we sort of bounce uh, things off each other and ask advice. Um, but as far as sort of the, the, the younger guys coming up, specifically Eric and Chris, um, uh, because they've expressed that. So, sure. yeah. As far as a mentor that got something wrong, as far as like something that advised me that was wrong or something. Yeah, or? like uh, it, it, it's an open question, so you know, just. Um, and you don't have to attribute them. I don't want you to. I certainly well, don't want you to. You know. I'm just. I'm just curious if there's yes, something. Yes. Yes. But it wasn't consequential because I. I did. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Follow. Uh, I guess. Not the advice, uh, uh, but 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 um, what they suggested would be a good idea. Uh, I didn't follow it, so there was no so there was no consequences for it that 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 I suffered from a negative standpoint. But it turns out that I'm glad I didn't do that. Um, so so I'm not gonna say they were wrong, but I mean yeah, I mean it's not it's not not like like not like mentors or or oracles, right? They have you know all the <laughs> secrets to the matrix, right? So, of course. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But that, that that comes with it, right? You know, you know, not everybody's experiences are the same. I tell anybody if you ask me advice, all I can tell you, I can't tell you, hey, do this, 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 check off these boxes, and you're guaranteed success. There's no such thing. I can just tell you, I did this, this is how it turned out. Or I did this, I don't recommend it. It's a new environment now, a new landscape. That may work. Didn't work for me, right? That that's the that's the best you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Sean, I certainly can't thank you enough for your time tonight. It's been an amazing show, uh, amazing conversation. Thank you for your time. Uh, absolutely Thank wonderful. You, Thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Yeah. Um, so everyone out there, we do really appreciate our audience as always. We appreciate all your likes, shares, and comments as usual. If you are a uh, fan of tonight's show, you can always check us out on Facebook, our LS Fumar page, where you're tuning in right now. And uh, 
be sure to like. And uh, as well, you can check us out on YouTube, our LL Safumar page there. If you're listening to us later on, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Podbean, or iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts, be sure you download, subscribe, and review. Uh, if you already are a subscriber, I really encourage you to unsubscribe, but please, please, please don't forget to resubscribe because that actually really helps my numbers and it helps me get fabulous uh, guests like our guest of honor, Sean Williams, tonight. Uh, really do appreciate that. So um, as as we kind of look forward to uh, 2021, this was a great way to kick off 2021 uh, with our very first guest of 2021 and Sean Williams of Cohiba Cigars. But we've got some great guests coming up. Rafael Nodal, Dean Parsons, Justo Iroa, just to name a few. Uh, so you can check out a list of upcoming guests on our our, our, our page this week. Things, by the way. Yeah. I'm so excited to be talking to them. Um, but for everyone out there, I really appreciate it. Again, I'm Barry Duplissy, live from the Lone Star Studios, presented by Alec Bradley of Euless, Texas. This is our 152nd take. He's Sean Williams. And guess what, everybody? We'll see you next time. Bye.